What is up, hackers and hackettes? How is it going today? How's everyone doing? It's uh, we've had uh, like a week of no rain in Seattle. It's a good week. Got the windows open. Got some fresh air going. It's a good day. All right. So today we're going to implement uh, uh, some code coverage techniques, and then we're going to make an example application to kind of stress the importance of code coverage. I know there are a lot of things that kind of talk about that and go along that path online. There are a lot of blogs and, and things, but we're just going to do it, and I want people to ask questions as we go through it. So um, code coverage is, is really important. It's uh, Mainly the reason code coverage is so important now is it's so accessible with things like AFL, with uh, passes on LLVM, with a lot of compilers giving you things, with open source projects that let you like lift your binary and add instrumentation. You can use things like QMU or full emulators to gather code coverage. Um, it's just so easy to get and the impact that it makes on your fuzzers is, is well worth it. Uh, obviously you can find academic papers that go further than code coverage. But a lot of those things just, uh, they're, they're not worth the amount of effort that you put in. Like code coverage is going to get you most of the way there. Um, and then you can fl add flourish here and there. But you're probably better off working on your mutators and your generators and, and learning the spec and auditing code. Yeah, Frida as well. So um, we actually don't have any code coverage implemented yet in... Uh, the vectorized emulator, and we're going to go through adding code coverage in that environment, and we're going to be using, um, since we're in a JIT, we actually have to implement code coverage in a JIT, which is, uh, uh, it's not a trivial problem, so there's going to be some fun, fun programming challenges in here, and I'll kind of go through how I implement my, my code coverage databases. So we're going to hop into uh, SoftServe, that's in the name of the vectorized emulator, we'll go into 6502 test. And we'll open up, uh, yeah, so we've got, this is kind of our application or our like fuzzing thing right now. We basically set up a callback that creates the master VM. That's going to uh, load up our like custom 6502 target and set up all the sections and the permissions on those sections. So we're kind of telling it where everything's at. Uh, we've got a fuzz callback, which currently doesn't really do anything. It just kind of clears the allocation bases. Um, we've got a VM exit callback um, that allows us to kind of catch um, this allows us to catch exceptions and kind of print interesting information when those things happen. We also use that to hook uh, some of these uh, like traps that we implement inside of the guest that allow us to know when a malloc occurs and when a free occurs. That allows us to basically add ASAN level support uh, for these targets at, at this level. So. All right, so we're going to need to add code coverage, which is um, which is not easy in a JIT. So we're going to go into uh, Folkl source. Um, I think we want to throw this in probably the actual JIT. Um, source Isle graph JIT is where the JIT lives. And the thing in question is going to be this uh, instruction start. So we basically want to implement our code coverage on instruction start. This is being given a PC identifier, and we're basically going to uh, we're going to implement uh, we're going to implement basically a hash table. Um, we're going to need to get access to that hash table from uh, from the JIT itself, um, and then we're going to populate entries. And if they've never been put in that hash table, it's actually going to look more like a cache. Um, actually, it's going to look more like a hash table. So. First of all, the, the code coverage, uh, to make a good hash is relatively expensive in terms of number of instructions. And because of that, we don't actually want to, um, we don't want to gather, we don't want to generate a hash in line. We want to actually have a function that we call. So we're going to add a function to our, our JIT, and this is in uh, um, I'll session. So we're going to kind of create a function. So when we when we create the MMU stuff, the what do we call these fields in um jit scratch? Nope. I think these are where do we make these? Somewhere. Uh here. So oh, actually not here. 
MMU Jits. That's what we're looking for. So we have this MMU Jits block, and we populate the MMU Jits. This basically creates functions that can be called from the JIT that allow us to do complex operations. It reduces the amount of instructions in the uh, instruction stream, which reduces instruction cache, cache usage, ah, usage, which also just provides a performance benefit. So we're going to implement another one. We're going to make a, um, this is going to be the code coverage implementation. And we'll do, uh, we'll just put it in a scope just to make it easy. And we'll start a new assembly stream. So code coverage, if you're not familiar with code coverage, it effectively is a technique to observe and gather information about the code that has been executed on a machine. Typically, this is done more from a higher level where you'll have a compiler that is aware of the instructions and then each instruction or block or edge um, is kind of encoded with those. So if, if you're kind of curious, let's pop up, uh, let's pop up Ida here quick. So just in case you're not too familiar with binary level things, we'll, we'll kind of go from the start. So this is just a, this is just a 6502 application. I think this is actually an sprintf implementation or, or something like that. Obviously there's going to be a bunch of subroutines where it does more stuff, but uh, it doesn't really matter what this function does. So in this case, when we're talking about code coverage, we're, we're sending an input through this application and it's, running these instructions and doing things with the input and doing things with global state. A lot of instructions won't actually be interacting with the input. They're for different state of the application and, and other things that are happening. Um, but it's still interesting information and filtering that stuff out is, is not easy. We can, we can do it with vectorized emulation and we'll get into that much later, but we're going to talk about basic coverage. So when you have the processor executing all of these instructions, uh, you can track each instruction which has been executed to tell you whether or not your input has executed new instructions. So let's say the common path in this case is the processor executes these things. And then in this case, the, uh, the, the value at uh, y, so this is deref'ing 0 and adding y to it. So this is actually a stack thing. If it's negative, b minus, um, then it goes here. So let's say the, the or if it, it goes here. So let's say the average case is it's not a negative number. And in that case, we execute this path. So in most cases, when we're doing code coverage, these things will get executed. We'll keep track that these instructions were executed, or we'll keep track of the block that gets executed. Um, typically, coverage is going to use blocks or edges because it's a, a reduction of the amount of, um, I don't know what you would want to call it, the amount of information. Um, Typically, if a block is hit, all of the instructions will be executed in that block. That is not always the case. You can have uh, a call to something inside of that block that typically faults or causes an exception in every case, in which case only the first few instructions execute. And then uh, let's say there was a call here instead of the store. Um, you might not see these things execute. And then you'd color this whole block as hit, which is not true. Sorry, got something in my throat. Um, so when we go down this path, uh, we would then, in, in a lot of coverage implementations, you would have this block covered and this block covered. Sometimes you would go by instructions, so you'd have each instruction covered separately. And sometimes you'll have something called edges. And an edge is basically this line in the graph. So it would say, this transition uh, happened. And edges are actually one of the most informational things because you can have you can have entry points to blocks from different locations. Let me find let me see if I can find an example of that. Uh, here's a good example. So if you did instruction level coverage or block level coverage, you would see that um, these instructions get executed. Let's say these get executed in most cases, and then these also get executed in most cases. But if we end up going down this path, we'll say that these new instructions got hit. But if this branches into this block, it's, it's probably good to consider that a separate state. So if you're doing edge coverage, um, so we can actually count what we have in this graph. We have, um, in this graph, there are one, two, three, four, five, six blocks. 
so six unique points of data, but there are one, two, three, four, five, there's six edges too. Um, but you can have, I guess, maybe you can't have more edges, but it's interesting information into an end block where you know where you came from. So you know that you're executing this block because you came from two different locations. And encoding that information is actually relatively important uh, for code coverage. Um, we might implement edge coverage, but we're going to start with instruction coverage because it's a little bit easier to understand. Um, is this another episode in a series or a uh, completely new topic? It's, it's uh, yeah, I would say it's in the series. It's, it's kind of a, a new topic, but it's kind of a tangent um, that's in the tree of the topic. So it's still, it's still kind of important in that. Do you use Lighthouse and Ida Pro? Uh, typically, I don't use Lighthouse. Um, obviously, I have it installed somewhere here uh, because Lighthouse is um, basically before Lighthouse required that you use like Dr. Cove uh, formats, and Dr. Cove formats are just they're so overcomplicated for what you're doing uh, in the traditional case. Um, but as of recently, Lighthouse has added due to like my and, and some of my coworkers' requests, they added uh, support for files. So let's, uh, let's open up an editor. So typically use Dr. Coverage formats, which are like a complex, I don't want to say proprietary format, but it's a format designed for a tool that we aren't. And when you have, when you have a format that was designed for another tool, it probably has some quirks and anomalies that made it easier to implement in the context of that tool. But that can be much harder to actually implement in your tool if you don't have those same quirks and anomalies. So the format that we actually got Lighthouse to support um, is just module offset separated by new lines. So we got this format added, which is really easy to generate from any situation that you have. So you can just put the module name in the offset. And now in this case, I probably will start using Lighthouse, but this was only recently added prior to that. It just wasn't it was too much work. It, it was I wasn't gonna write a Dr. Cove file generator for every single every single fuzzer I wrote. So yeah, it supports a, a couple other formats, but all of them are are very very complex formats. Um, and this is what I wanted. I just wanted module offset. So that is the um, that has been added. That's in the like beta branch. It's not actually in the master branch yet, um, but I've used it and it works great. So that's we will probably end up using that today. I think, maybe, I, I, it might, it might be block based, I don't know, I don't know if it works on instructions or blocks, and if it works on blocks and we're doing instruction coverage, it might get a little weird. Now we can make block coverage, and in fact, almost all the tools that I write, I'll have a, uh, like a enum or something at the top of the file that lets you control the different types of, of tracking that you do. Uh, does KCOV in the Linux kernel have edge coverage? I'm actually not familiar with the KCOV internal workings, so I, I, I sadly cannot speak to that. I would suspect it's probably blocker edge. No one really does instruction coverage, um, but I don't know for sure. Okay. So for code coverage implementation, all we need to do, um, these all emit rets. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna implement, we're gonna start off the block by doing an assembly.ret. And now we have a function getting invoked and we'll do asm.int3. And I just wanna get all the plumbing done. And once the plumbing is complete, we're gonna be able to, um, let's translate. Let's translate the address, translate and then access. Um, inserting op size there. So we're gonna have to add another structure. And then you jits right next to MMU jits. So we're gonna add a um, uh, code coverage uh, jit code coverage jit. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, and we'll say. The, uh, u size is the JIT address to brand, uh, to call into when coverage should be uh, checked and logged. We'll be talking about register coverage today. Yeah, I should be able to get to that. Um, 
Uh, it's hard to say. I actually have like a Halloween party tonight, so I do have an end time for the stream. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see if we can get to that. But if we can, we'll definitely go into that. That's going to be the natural progression from where we are. So, okay. Um. Oh, 724. I think I have a way. Yeah, asm.asm. So that gets me access to the assembly stream, and we'll look into those. Okay, so those should be good. And now all we need to do is in our JIT implementation, um, on instruction start, so if true, then we will uh, let, we'll get access to the uh, code coverage JIT is equal to self dot, um, actually, where do we, where do we store that information? In this function context, where do we get that? Oh, we actually passed that structure in. Ooh, hmm, 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 hmm. MMU JIT adders, okay, and then we'll have, uh, we'll just pass this in the um, code coverage JIT, and we'll pass an option U size, and then here we'll just make it optional to pass in. So when we get to an instruction start, we'll say if let sum, or if let sum uh, CC JIT is equal to this, then all we're going to do is we're just going to call that function right now. So we haven't implemented that function. We don't know what it's going to do. I'm just going to steal this, the actual call routine. And that is here. We're going to do a call to ccjit as i64. So now this function should get called uh, every case. Obviously, we're going to have a couple warnings because we have to plumb some things through. Um, 316. Yep, so this needs to take in uh, aisle session dot code coverage JIT. Oops. And that option is movable, so that should be fine. I'm going to move that window kind of to the side. Okay, so now we have that implemented. So now we need to also fill it in. So we don't currently have it. Um, we don't actually have that function filling it in yet, so uh, populate MMU jits. And here we'll do uh, self dot this um, code coverage jit is equal to sum. And what is translate there? Is that the address? Uh, create asm. Get the instruction address. So the first one starts at translate and then Okay, yeah. So this is the um, JIT adder. So we're going to say um, set that this code coverage JIT function exists. And now we should hopefully see some int threes getting hit. I'm going to change this to be single threaded just to make our life easier. Always better to work single threaded uh, initially. And then we'll bring up putty so we can go in and we can use GDB on this system. Okay, so it does look like that's probably hitting that block. So we'll do a gdb.6502 test. And hopefully we're hitting an int 3 and we're just, uh, we've got a ret right after. So x and i pc. Yep, so if we go back one, there's our int 3 and our ret. And that's going to uh, step instruction uh, x and i pc. This should be after we ret. That looks good. If we go back five, that should be the call. Um, and that's exactly what we want to see. So before every single one of these, uh, before every single one of these invocations, we're going to log that that PC is getting covered. Um, okay. And there are a couple different ways that we can implement coverage. So we can have the JIT itself update the um, code coverage information, but I don't think we're actually going to do that. I think we're going to have the JIT return out in a code coverage situation, um, and then it will re-enter kind of where it's at. I, let me think about that. So if you have the your code coverage stuff, so we're going to make a database, uh, and that's going to have to go into the ILVM. 
So in here, we're going to have, actually, no, this is going to go into the global um, aisle session. And in here, we're going to pass in a, um, this is going to be the code coverage hash table. And uh, this will provide a way to detect if coverage has already been reported such that we don't exit, exit the JIT. And we're going to make a constant. We're going to say uh, const code coverage table size. And this will be the number of entries in the code coverage database. In this case, it's just uh, a bitmap. Um, so we're going to do um, size of the code coverage table in bytes. Each coverage event is a bit, thus, uh, each coverage event is a bit, thus this uh, cover, uh, thus this coverage, each coverage event is a bit, thus this coverage table is eight times, uh, yeah, eight times greater than the constant, thus the coverage, yep. So we're gonna set it to, uh, let's start with 32 megs. That will give us, uh, that will give us 256 million different uh, coverage entries in the database. That, that'll that probably be good enough for us uh, for what we're doing. So I think we made that in the aisle session, uh, struct aisle session. Uh, and then we're gonna say code coverage. This is a vec U8, and then down here, um, we're going to have code coverage, and this is going to be a, a vector, starts at 0, U8, and code coverage table size. And that's going to have to get passed into the JIT as well as the code coverage tape. Actually, we don't need to pass that into the JIT because we're going to, um, we're going to know, uh, what are we, MMU JITs, populate MMU JITs. So all we need to do is we need to implement some sort of calling convention for this function. And I think what we're going to say is that uh, racks and rbx, um, racks, uh, that's going to be the PC, and rbx is going to be like further information. Um, and that's going to be like whatever you want it to be. So we're setting this up so that it will work for register coverage. Um, but we'll pass in the PC into Rack. So this will be the target uh, PC of the coverage event. And so we're going to have those two in Racks and RBX. And we're going to make an asm dot asm um, dot and. Um, if I, I'm trying to remember correctly if BTS is actually relatively fast. So let's go down to our enter JIT. And let's find if we have any place to pass in a register. Um, where do we define our calling convention? I think it's up here. OK, so R15. I think we're using R15 now. Um, that is the raw trace structure, which allows us to pass in kind of arbitrary things. And I think. For code coverage, we actually are going to put it in this raw trace structure. Um, raw trace here, and we're going to put in a mutable pointer to U8s. Uh, create a tuple with instructions, blah, blah, blah. Um, tuple is 0. This is the um, instructions executed. And this is going to be at offset OXOO. Then we're going to have at 1 OX8. This is going to be a pointer to instruction trace. 2, this is going to be an OX. And an instruction trace is different than coverage because a trace will tell you all of the instructions and the sequence. Uh, but coverage is just going to tell you kind of binary whether or not you hit something. Okay, so when we get down to here, on our poor null mute, and then we just have another field. This is going to be the coverage table. 
And we'll just plumb this through here. That's going to be a uh, U size. Uh, technically, we can do, actually, it will be a U size. So enter JIT. We'll pass in uh, session dot. Um, what do we call it? Coverage uh, I'll session struct code coverage. Okay. Code coverage dot as pointer. And all the threads are going to use the exact same code coverage table um, because that size is going to be pretty huge. So, okay, uh, 27. Yep, we didn't do this constant right. We need a U size and equals. And now we just have a complaint down here at 738. And we're going to say uh, must be a power of 2. And we're going to enforce that power of 2 down in the um, uh, where we up uh, populate MMU jits. So down here, we're going to say assert that this dot count ones is equal to 1. Uh, was not a power of two. So make sure the code, uh, make sure the coverage table size is a power of two. And if it's not, then this will assert and it will panic out. So then down here, we need to basically um, make sure, so we're gonna compute a hash here. And to compute this hash, we're gonna use uh, the AES instructions. So we've got, um, We've got racks and RBX. We actually want to keep the target PC, so we don't want to clobber uh, the RAX register. Sorry, I'm moving the microphone. Um, asm.asm.move. We're going to move into RCX from racks. And this is going to be like save off a copy of PC into RCX. And that will allow us to report that when we have a VM exit uh, a coverage event. So we'll be able to say, this new PC was executed, and then we'll have further information in there too. So now I need uh, two random numbers. Uh, hex random dot rand int zero two to the sixty four, and now we have two random numbers. So we're gonna load these into uh, what registers do we have? Scratch here, RSI and RDI we can use as well. So we're gonna get uh, we're gonna move into reg RSI. An immediate of this and we're also gonna do that with the other one and we'll say u64 as i64 okay so r sign rdi so uh, load some random numbers into r sign rdi and then we're gonna XOR those with our um, we're going to XOR those with the uh, target PC and the further information. So we'll do dot .move uh, into register dot .xor register racks with reg RSI. And the reason for this is the AES instructions. If you have repetition in the AES instructions, uh, you actually get a, a predictable sequence or like a repetitive sequence out of them. Um, so we're going to... XOR some random entropy into racks and RBX to make sure that the AES NI instructions don't uh, produce um, patterns. So, because we don't want the like AES uh, instructions making those patterns, because that dramatically weakens the quality of the hash. So, we'll load racks into RCX. We, X, uh, we load up these constants into R sign RDI. We then XOR those two fields. And everything looks pretty good at that point. So then we're going to do uh, asm.asm.packed uh, insert, uh, insert a Q, packed insert uh, quad word. There's a chance that I don't have this implemented in my. Um, in my assembler, I'm not sure. This takes a reg racks, and then it will take a an immediate. Let me see if this works, and I'll explain what this instruction does. 
in a second. Oh yeah, none of these things are in the scope. Um, we just need to, we'll bring, uh, what's it complaining about? Immediate and reg. So we need immediate and reg. And we'll need, we'll need memory as well. Uh, and then we'll also pull in the regs. All right, we're getting there. Uh, 3D6, this one's a U size, done. Down in 9.15, this one's a Asmute U8. Oops. And finally at 7.59, oops, 7.59, we don't have packed insert quad word. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, let's see. Ooh, yeah, we don't have those instructions implemented at all, so we're going to have to implement those kind of manually in assembly. So we're going to go into uh, uh, test.asm here, actually. Really? Huh. Test.asm bit 64, origin 0. And we're going to do a... Uh, all we're going to do is so XMM registers... Uh, XMM registers are 128 bits, and we have two, coincidentally, we have two 64-bit values. What are the odds? So we're going to do a packed insert quad word into XMM 0 of racks at offset 0 of quad word index 0, and then we're going to load up RBX into XMM 0, and that's going to make XMM 0 contain uh, RBX colon racks. That's effectively what we're doing, is we're loading racks into the 0th quad word, of XMM0, and then we're going to load RBX into the, the first, or the the number one um, uh, quad word there. So that will put it in the high value. doesn't really matter if it's in the high or low value. We don't really care. So let me see if I have AES encode in my... Wow, I don't have AES instructions. Okay, so we're going to have to... We'll implement kind of everything here. So then in here, we'll do AES inc XMM0, XMM0. Oops. We're just going to do that four times. And there you go. There's our hash. That's our hash function. So racks and RBX are loaded into those. And then we're going to shuffle all the bits around to kind of mix mix up the, the high part and the low part. And then at the end, we're going to have a um, uh, vector move quad word uh, we can actually do that in our assembler so we'll do that so all of these instructions and these should be vectored AES encode that'll make them use the AVX instructions which is friendlier to the uh, pipeline because it isn't swapping modes uh, and then here we have a I hate how the terminal never works the first try nasm f bin test.asm Six and seven, uh, uh, packed insert quad word. Okay. And then I think maybe we can do the V. Yep. So we're going to do all of these as the AVX encodings. And this as them B64 test.asm. Uh, test. Uh, test. Okay. So here are the instructions. And we're going to just add these into the, the pipeline here. So I'm just going to type these out, and this is going to be, I'll copy and paste the assembly such that we remember. Um, I just didn't want to implement the ABX instructions yet in my uh, assembler. It's just another encoding that's just going to be a pain in the ass. So I only support ABX 512. Okay. Load that, load that, perform the AES stuff, and we'll do... Asm dot asm dot uh, um, what do we call it? Raw, raw bytes. Yeah, raw bytes. So do asm dot asm dot raw bytes, and then I'm just gonna do an xxd on test. Oh no! Uh, SQL slash program files. Vim. X 
six D I test. Okay. So these are the bytes. We'll just format these, kind of clean them up a little bit. And there we go. So then we're gonna extract that. So uh, V move quad word. So down here we're gonna we're gonna load that into a register. We'll load it into uh, RDX. We haven't used RDX yet in this function, and that's exactly what the instruction does. So we're gonna set the vector width to 128, uh, move ZMM0 into RDX, and then set the vector width back to 512. And then at this point RDX should have a unique quote unquote hash for the two values that are pa passed into this function, RAX, which is the target PC, and RBX, which is further information. So we're going to go into um, int start, and then here we're going to make sure that we use that calling convention, asm.move reg RAX, and we're going to load an immediate of uh, PC as an i64. And then we're going to do an asm.xor, uh, reg rbx r reg rbx. We're gonna zero out the informational field. So currently we don't use further information because PC coverage we don't we don't need that. So this is gonna be um, uh, let's see. This is gonna populate uh, code coverage information. Okay. So that looks good. And let's see if it builds. Not quite. Um, yep, that needs to be asm dot asm in the little parens. Um, all right, so that does work. And then we'll see uh, what this looks like in GDB. So hopefully RCX will contain PC, and then RDX will contain this like hash looking thing. So IR, we've got. Uh, there's PC and RCX, and then in RDX we have this like completely random um, sort of thing. So here we see the like things that we loaded into the uh, AES encode. So we have basically this RDI constant directly because we XORed with zero. We have in racks we have RSI, which is the random number XORed with 2000. You can see the 38 instead of the 18. And then in RDX we have our like hash that we use the AES instructions to produce that, like, very quick, cheap hash. All right. Now what we're going to do is uh, BTS. Hopefully I have that one implemented. Okay, I do. So then we're going to do a... Um, we know that we pass in a pointer to at an R15. So... Uh, R15 plus OX10, this is the um, uh, pointer to the hash table can be found at this. So we're going to get that. So we're going to move that into racks. We don't need racks anymore. Um, we're going to do a move into reg racks of a memory sum R15, none, and a OX10. So this will get the pointer to the hash table, and then we're going to do an uh, asm.asm.bts. If you're not familiar with BTS, we'll, uh, it's called a uh, BTS is bit test and set. And effectively what that's going to do is it's going to take the bit index of the... Um, it's going to take the bit index of what you want, so it's going to, if you're accessing a byte pointer... Um, in, in our case, we're actually going to use a quad pointer, so I'm going to make a change quick. But basically, it will find the bit index automatically uh, into a memory access. So you can give it the base of memory and then a bit index of 10 million, and it will find that that should be at this byte and this, uh, this bit in that byte. So let's see. Coverage uh, table size in quadrants uh, in U64s. Um, must be a power of 2. 
And in this case, we'll just drop it down to uh, we'll drop it down to 16, and then code coverage table size that will go OU64 code coverage, and this is gonna be a U64. Okay, so we're gonna do a, a bit test and set. Uh, first, we have to mask off. Uh, so now we we have in um. Inside of RDX, that's our hash. So we're gonna mask that off. We're gonna do an and of register RDX with an immediate, which will be this. Um, uh, we'll do const uh, code coverage table bits. This will be a u size, and it will be this times 64 um, size of the code coverage table in bits. So that's the number of unique entries that we have in the code coverage table. And for here, we'll load up this minus one. So we're going to end with that minus one, and then we'll do a bit test and set off of um, memory sum racks, non zero. And we'll do a, uh, we'll do a reg RDX. So what this is going to do is it's going to find the bit index for RDX, which will always fit in our, our code coverage table. And then it will check that bit. It will move the carry flag. will get the uh, old bit and then the new bit. Uh, and then the bit will be ORed with uh, one. So basically get the old bit value and then it will OR in the new bit um, every time. So at that point... Uh, what I can do is an asm dot. Hmm. Here I'll do an asm dot asm dot jump carry to branch short, and we have to make a, a label here. Actually, we we can use a, a constant label. So we're gonna say branch to um, jump not carry branch to no new coverage, or we're gonna say like already reported. Okay, and then in this case, we're going to do an asm.asm.label already reported. So we're only going to hit this in three when new coverage events occur. So we're going to swap this to a ret. We're going to load, uh, we're going to make a new uh, coverage event VM exit code. Let's see what we have for constants here. So we're going to assign this. Um, code coverage and we'll just print uh, or we'll panic panic code coverage occurred okay and then that will be in uh, racks is the exit code so that we're just gonna do a move into reg racks of an immediate which is that constant uh we wanted to hopefully we updated that down there we did okay so return out when new coverage is observed and branch short we got to pull that in and expect a nice 64 find i size um Okay, and up here, we just got to pull this in. Okay, that's looking good. So this should cause an interrupt or an int three instruction on all new coverage events, or actually this is uh, calling up already. Um, uh, JNC, jump not carry. Oh, JC, yeah, we did want this. So if the carry flag is set, that means the old bit was already set to one. So this should now panic because we observed new coverage on the first instruction. Oh, technically that ret is not gonna work. Uh, asm.asm.int3. The reason that's not gonna work is because the return address is actually um, 
in this case, we're already one ret into the thing. So let's see. We should hit this in three. Good. If we do this, uh, we'll be returning to the wrong location. 10 IPC. Yep. X 10 XG RSP. We have the two different return addresses here. This is the one we want. So we're going to want to return all the way up to there. Um, and to do that, uh, we'll just do a um, asm.asm.add reg rsp m8. So we're going to pop off the, that rsp and then we're going to return all the way up and break out of legit. So this is now correct. Okay, there's our panic. Code coverage occurred. Occurred might be spelled wrong there. I'm not sure. Um, and at this point, we want to actually move RCX into the... Um, let's see. Where is... Where is... At the end of here, I think we provide one info field. Um, exit value. And let me see if we use that for the retry address. Okay, so that's an okay. So address of the aisle instruction to re-execute. So we're gonna have that, and that's gonna be in R ten. So basically, when we have when we do this uh, code coverage, we need to know where to return back to in the JIT. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say um, the R10, this exit value, is going to take... That will contain the, um, the PC that we should jump back into for the JIT to resume execution. So in this case, we have a uh, retry address... Okay, that looks good. Um, and then we're gonna, I guess we have to fill in two more fields here um, in this tuple. So we'll put two U64s, and in here we're gonna put the uh, three. This is at OX18. This is the um, code coverage PC, and 420. This will be the code coverage um, info. So when we go and implement our BTS now, uh, we have our load here, this memory, this move. So before we actually do anything, um, we don't need to actually save off that into RCX anymore. Okay. Instead, we're going to save off to uh, 18 and 20. We're going to save off uh, reg racks reg rbx uh save off the code coverage um pc and information fields and these are memory accesses but it doesn't matter because code coverage uh will be silenced so we're going to actually get rid of we're going to disable code coverage once it's been hit on an instruction okay so uh, code coverage occurred and then here we'll get the uh, pc is going to be equal to the, um, and we could start naming the structure. We'll probably start heading that direction. So raw trace dot three and four. And let uh, info is going to be uh, trace raw dot four. So code coverage occurred at this with info this PC and info. So we're getting there. We're, we're almost there. As long as these fields came up correctly, and they should. So info should be zero, and PC should be 2,000 hex. Uh, yep, 2,000 and info zero. Perfect. Worked exactly as I wanted. Uh, get the PC and info information for this. Uh, get the PC and info for this coverage event. And then this retry address. Uh, we're going to need to actually have that in our inst start. Um, let me see how I do this down here. Okay, so when we do these memories and memwrites, we actually store the address of the 
instructions. So we're going to do this. Um, actually, we're going to do this. So this will cause us to re-enter the JIT at this location. So we basically save off um, the instruction address into R10. Technically, we could do an LEA and do it riprel. Um, so here we get the instruction address. We then move that into R10. That means when this exits out, there's going to be a... It will set this retry address. So execution will resume at this location. And then we just need to return out uh, with resulting online. Um, uh, resulting online, resulting online caused the VM exit. And then we'll also have an aisle result coverage. And this is going to take the PC and info. And we're just going to have to implement a new aisle result. So we're going to go into uh, SP bulk aisle source aisle graph lib uh, mod uh, enum aisle results. Uh, and we'll do coverage. Uh, VM exited due to new coverage at PC as PC and with info. Uh, with, uh, at PC and info. Okay. So now that should be plumbed through. Coverage is not handled in the exit code case. Good. So we're now going to, uh, go up to, uh, probably like right up here. We're going to do all results, coverage, PC, info. Here, we'll just print that out, and we don't have to disable any VMs because we're just going to go and re-execute, and the online should stay the same. Okay. Code coverage occurred at 2000 with info that. Um... Is that really all that's executing? So we executed a 2000. Is that true? That doesn't seem right. Let me, gra let me grab the test program. Um, that is in dev soft serve 6502 test. And test app, test app program. Yeah. Test main. Ooh, is it test main now? I think it is. Let me end make that. Uh, we'll go into here. Yep. That. Oh, that is creating test up program. Okay. Perfect. We'll pop that in here. Load it up. Uh, 6502. We're going to load it at 2000 minus A. Here's our application. Here's the entry point. I'm going to change this font because it's a little too big. Okay, so we're executing 2000. So code coverage occurred at 2000. Then coverage occurred at 2094. And then coverage occurred at 2097, which is true. And then it returned to here, uh, which is 2003. Okay, so it is correct. So this is, yeah, this, wow, okay. Um, so that, now we have coverage information on these and it's self-silencing because we don't see coverage events occurring down here. Now, that coverage is being executed right now, every instruction. So if we looked at our performance, we would see that it has fallen through the floor. So if I look at, um, we're gonna put on eye count uh, stuff, track eye count. We're gonna set this to true. And this will give us, uh, give us an instruction count uh, speed, and I'm going to change the font on this as well. We're going to go down to 14. That might be a little small for a stream, so we're going to put it to 16. Okay, so this is saying that we're getting, uh, this is getting uh, 14 million instructions per second, and if we turn off coverage, uh, code coverage JIT. So if we just did if false, honestly, we can just comment it out. 
So we're going to comment out our covered stuff, and we're going to see how that improves our performance. So it was uh, 14 million uh, instructions per second, and now it is surprisingly... Oh, this, has, this is... Um, we need to add a hot loop in here, so let's do that. Uh, let's add a hot loop to our application. So we're actually uh, testing the perf more accurately. So we're going to go into here. We're going to modify our test.c. And I think I have a sp test, test main. And in here, I should have this like hot loop, hot bench. So we're going to do void, hot bench, void. And we're just going to call that. So that's going to call our benchmarking stuff to get invoked. OK, so we'll see our performance. Uh, here we go. So in this case, we're getting like 4 billion instructions per second. This is single threaded. Um, yeah, 4.3, 4.4 billion instructions per second. And we're going to then disable, or then we're going to enable coverage. And this is hopefully going to look really bad. If it doesn't, I'm going to be impressed. But the perf is going to really be hurt by this coverage because we're, we're computing a hash every instruction and doing like a couple memory lookups. Um, so now the perf, yeah, now the perf went, it went from 4 billion to 0.4 billion. So it was a 10x slowdown to gather this coverage. Now we can get creative about that. So what we can do is we know that R10, uh, we know that R10 points to uh, a move instruction followed by an XOR followed by a call. So what I'm going to do is um, we're going to replace this instruction. So we're going to replace this instruction with a, um, we can either knock out the call or we can replace it with a, an unconditional jump that jumps over these instructions. So I think the jump will be easier. Um, I need to know how big this instruction window is. So I'm going to do this. Uh, let begin is equal to this. Let end is equal to this. Print, uh, uh, or we'll do size, minus begin. And this will be. Um, We'll just print the size here so I don't have to do the math. And then we'll uh, put an assert there to make sure we never change the size of that. Because if we're doing a branch, then we need to, uh, oops, we didn't hit it yet. Uh, 13. OK. So we're going to assert that size is equal to 13. That's going to, uh, we're going to say like, um, Hard coded size changed. And then we're going to replace this instruction right here, which is uh, cur PC um, plus uh, this is going to be a, a 10 byte instruction. Move R10. Let me double check that. I could actually have this. I'm trying to think. I could maybe do it cleaner. I could have it LEA that address. Um, we have this. We know that this instruction is going to be um, assert this is equal to 10. And that should be true. I think it's a 10 byte instruction. It's a rex prefix, an E. Uh, a one byte opcode and then an eight byte immediate. Okay, looks good. So that means we know that we can replace this instruction here with a branch. And we're going to have to replace two bytes at the same time and the bytes are gonna have to be aligned. Otherwise, it's not going to be um, thread safe. Keep in mind, another thread could be executing this code as we modify these bytes. Um, now this instruction, since this instruction is large enough, we can actually replace the first two bytes if it's aligned with a single move um, to replace that instruction. However, um, let's see. Um, we need to either align it or we need to use like a lock exchange uh, word. Um, 
and a lock exchange might be easier. Uh, then we don't have to worry about the alignment of this instruction. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to go to uh, our code coverage and or yeah coverage here code coverage occurred here and then we're gonna um the first thing we want to do is patch out the um coverage invocation with a branch past the coverage stuff whatever um so we're gonna say this is going to be a pointer to an atomic U16. So we're going to do, uh, we know that the re-execution point, uh, where is that at? I forget where that we put that. Uh, JIT entry address. So this dot unwrap. So we're going to get the address. Now we know where the instruction is. So we can say print uh, hex. Uh, JIT entry adder. So that's the address of the of the location that we just caused new coverage from. So let's see if that looks good. Honestly, we could just have it self-patching. We're gonna make it self-patching. We we don't need to, we don't need to do this at this level. We can do it down here. We can do it in the assembly itself. Oh, I don't have lock instruction support. Um, but in this case, if we make it aligned, so we're going to assert uh, cur PC is equal to um, we'll do uh, while, while this and one, while that is not equal to zero. We're going to two byte align the instruction. Then we'll do as and dot nop. So while it's not two byte aligned, insert nops. So if it is two byte aligned, we have no nop. If it is, then we fill that in. OK. Uh, and then we're going to replace cur PC. So we'll do an asm dot move uh, mem sum r10. We just already have that address, so we might as well use it none followed by a zero so we're going to replace the instruction there we're going to do a move and we're going to do a 16-bit move uh do i support a 16-bit move in my assembler orgasm uh bit 16 perfect so asm dot set mode as mode bit 16 and then we're going to go back to 64-bit mode. So temporarily, we're going to do a 16-bit move, and we're going to put a, uh, we'll put a CCCC. So this means the next time that instruction executes, we'll see a breakpoint. So we should see a coverage event, and then we'll see a breakpoint occur. Uh, this needs to be an immediate. Okay. Bit 16 and that. And I'm going to put, uh, before we do this, I'm going to do a, an asm.int3 here. So since we're doing self-modifying code, things can get a little wonky. Um, here we go. Let's see what happens. So we'll see that int3, and we're going to see what it's about to do. Uh, truncation on a 16-bit immediate. Uh, ooh. Um, I know why. This is uh, I sixteen as I sixty four. We want to um, we want to make sure that gets sign extended. Otherwise, it's not encodable in a in that field. Um, U sixteen. Oh, we're gonna have to do this as U sixteen as I sixteen as that. Okay, this should work, hopefully. Uh, that minus 10. Okay, in that case, that's true because we, we changed the size of that. Uh, we'll do that here. Uh, 
Okay. Almost there. Okay, that looks good. X10 IPC. So we should see that this instruction, how is that not aligned? Oh, is it because of where we put our N3? Yeah, so it should always be unaligned, which is incorrect. But then we load up the address of itself into R10 and then Whoa. Whoa, my assembler is not emitting the right thing for a 16 bit move. Oh, uh, hmm. Hmm. Really? What is it emitting? Okay, well, we'll, we'll handwrite it just to make it easier. Test.asm. So all we need is a move word R10 OXCCCC. Uh, NASM FN and this ASM test. Okay. So we're going to do. My, my assembler must be broken for 16 bit mode. I'm not too surprised. That's not something I think I have tests for. So we'll do an ASM.move or an asm dot raw bytes uh and this will be a ox66 ox41 oxc7 ox02 oxcc oxcc this is going to be a move word r10 oxccc all right i need to fix that in my assembler Kind of annoying. X10 IPC. Uh, we're going to load R10 with those CCs. That looks good. That means the next time. Uh, okay. Uh, What? We continued and then we hit the second one. We started with that in three and then we continued. We got our code coverage event and then we went to re-enter and then we hit our in three. Okay, makes sense. So due to the re-entry, we ended up executing the CC. So we want to get rid of this in three get the current instruction address. We're going to overwrite it with, in this case, we're gonna overwrite it with an EB. Um, and this will be a 13 plus uh, 16. So we're gonna assert that as well. So we're gonna say, we're actually gonna assert this whole thing. Uh, that minus cur PC. We're gonna assert that this whole block is uh this should be 13 plus 16 bytes whatever that is uh 39 or 29 sorry uh hard coded size changed okay cool so this is going to be an eb and then it's going to be a uh, a jump of 29 minus 2 because we want to subtract up the two bytes from the instruction itself and then prior, we're going to do an asm.int3, and this will let us see what we're about to do. And we're not using asm mode, so we can clear that. Okay, where's this at? Okay, that's good. We're going to check out what we got. X10i PC. So we're going to load that into R10, the address of itself. It's two byte aligned. Then we're gonna do a, a move word pointer R10, EB1B. Um, and that will cause this instruction to get replaced. So if we did times uh, short 
uh, unsigned short this is equal to OXEB1B. Um, what? Can't you do that? What? I thought you could just evaluate stuff in GDB. Um, I thought you could do that. Let's do a C expression GTB. I, I thought you, it must be another thing. Can I interpret most. Okay. C plus plus expressions. Prefixed it with set. Yeah, I did that. And then it doesn't like unsigned short. Um, we can just try short. Hopefully this will do the trick. Oh, does this have to have an asterisk? No. Is there a get? No. What if you just do this? Of a non-pointer value. Yup. Uh, oh, is it, do I need more parens here? Nope. I thought that worked. Ah. <laughs> uh, syntax error near this. Am I going crazy? Like, I'm pretty sure that normally works. Uh, GB set. Um. Oh my God! Why is this so bad? Uh, okay, this one. Will, this will set. What? Yeah, isn't that what I'm doing? Does it really need the space and a space here? No. Like this just doesn't work, right? Oops. Yeah, okay, so GDB just doesn't work. Uh, so if you're familiar with GDB, you'll know that it just doesn't work most of the time. Um, and they change it every week to not work in different ways. Um. Well, that's annoying. <laughs> how 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 am I gonna set memory? I mean, we'll just let it execute. So we'll just uh, x10i pc step step step. Uh, now that has occurred. So now we can take a look at that. Uh, uh, x10xb. Oh, I did the I did it the wrong way. I did my ending this wrong. Uh, this EB. Yeah, the curly braces maybe. I mean, it's you're supposed to be able to do it uh, with C expressions, but I'm not too surprised. GDB pretty much never works. It's it's so it's so broken. Like I don't I don't know how people actually use this tool. Um so we have this address here. Step 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 x10i this. Okay, so we have a jump to 33 and 33 is 33 is the instruction afterwards. So yep, we replaced ourselves with a branch to the next thing and we skip over all this stuff. So once we've executed um, the coverage stuff once, we then disable it with replacing it with a, um, with a branch over it. And it's an unconditional branch. It's more instructions in the pipeline, which kind of sucks, but, uh, the processor is pretty, pretty good about those things. 
And when we switch to block coverage, it won't matter nearly as much. So we're getting like 4 billion before, then we're getting 400 um, million. And now we're back up to, yeah, now we're back up to 3 billion. Probably, we're probably actually up to, to 4 billion again. So we took a small performance hit because we added some instructions to the stream. Um, but it's not that big of a deal. So when we go to block level, that that overhead just kind of doesn't matter as much anymore. So now we're getting 3.6 billion per second with coverage enabled. Uh, and then we'll go to, we'll pull on, uh, we'll pull up these threads. Um, oops, wrong window. Oh, whistle. So we'll see what this perf looks like with all the threads online. Yep, looks like what we're kind of used to. Um, okay. So that looks good. So now we have coverage information getting called out, and that means we can manage that coverage in whatever database format we want, um, and then it's self-silencing in the JIT. So it, it basically is uh, quiets itself down. So what that means is we can now write, uh, we need to implement feedback and like a database of inputs and like a concept of inputs. And so to do that, um, I'm gonna wanna add that to aisle session. So we're gonna have, we're gonna have an input database. Uh, let's see how I wanna do this. I'm gonna wanna hash these inputs. Okay, so we're going to have our code coverage database, which will refer to inputs. And inputs will be in our input database. And I think I'm going to need to use my atomic hash table implementation. Uh, that's going to be the best data structure for this. So we're going to go into uh, Franzia, or uh, TKO plus Franzia, shared atomic hash table. And we're going to pull that into soft serve and we're going to make uh folk il we'll take in a dependency on that uh what was this um aht atomic hash table and we'll open that up down here So this is atomic hash table. It's a hash table that um, is thread safe and allows all of the keys to be accessed. Um, it, it allows multiple threads to access um, everything in the hash table basically as it's uh, as it's running, and it doesn't have to lock the whole database because locking the whole hash table is way too slow. So. We're gonna have uh, we're gonna have an input database. This is gonna be an atomic hash table, and that will take a U128, and that will look up a the contents that it will point to will be a U size. I think um, I might also need my atomic vec implementation as well. Uh, we'll start with the coverage database. So the coverage database is going to take a um, it's going to take a key which is a u size followed by a u size. This is going to be the the coverage PC and the coverage info. That's going to then point to u128. So coverage database that takes a uh, PC and coverage info and uh, refers to an input hash that caused that coverage to occur. Okay. And we'll have to pull an HT here. And HT. Okay, coverage database. Looks good. And then down in aisle session, we'll do a uh, coverage DB is equal to HT. Oh, this might have atomic vec kind of built in. Uh, this will be new. 
and then it will have the number of entries that we will allow. So we'll allow for uh, we'll allow for a million coverage entries right now. Allocate the coverage database. Okay, that looks good. Nice. Now we can go to our coverage um, event down here. Not here, but here. And I'll say this aisle session dot cover uh, db dot fetch or lock and the uh, use size. So we're going to make a hash for this. And the hash is going to be the info shifted to uh, as a U128 shifted to the left by uh, 64. Or um, you usually do use curly braces. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I must have missed that then. Uh, info or PC. I thought you could use like normal C expressions. I, I, I swear I've done it before. As U128, uh, create the hash for this entry. And then fetcher lock is going to take a... Uh, fetcher insert, sorry. Fetcher insert is going to take the key, which is going to be the PC info. It's going to take a hash. And then this is going to return... A match here and in the okay case this is going to contain um, existing so that will happen um, if the coverage was existing otherwise there will be an error um, this will take a hash entry which will then need me to fill in the hash and with the actual the hash so that's going to be the value so that's going to look at that up in the database, and then um, that's also like hash int. So we're going to look up uh, PC info using this hash in the coverage database. If it exists, um, if it exists, then we just do nothing. And there are race conditions here where two threads could potentially be reporting the same coverage. This will get rid of the race conditions because they will no longer, uh, they'll be deduped at this point. Uh, which is simple. Um, not interpreted as shift. We just have to put some uh, prints around there. So we'll get 128 bit hash. Then this, uh, that can't be dereferenced. I think I might have like a setter on there. That's a hash entry. Um, a dot insert. And I guess I box it. I box the the value. Yeah, by boxing it, it means the hash table has pointers rather than um, okay. So now we have all of these code coverage occurred with that. So now I need to make the concept of a fuzz input. Um, and so we're gonna make in ILVM, which is the per thread thing. We're going to have the uh, fuzz inputs. And this will be a pub. Or actually, this is going to be fuzz input. This will be a vec u8. This will be the fuzz input. Simple. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make a, a relatively sophisticated getter that's going to cause... Um, this is actually going to be a fuzz input. And we're going to make a complex getter that allows the hash to be automatically computed every time you update the fuzz input. Um, so we're going to have the input. So the raw bytes of the fuzz input. Um, structure representing a fuzz input. Raw bytes of the fuzz inputs because we have uh, eight. Um, and we should get that from vectorized. Uh, what is that? The vector width. Yeah. So we'll pull this in. I might actually have a couple eights somewhere. Maybe not. So this will have the raw bytes of the fuzz inputs. Easy. And then we'll have another thing that's going to be um, this will be the input hashes, 
input hashes is going to be equal to uh, u128 followed by vector width. Uh, representing fuzz, representing fuzz inputs. So fuzz input there, fuzz input here, and then we're gonna uh, then we're gonna make a structure here, um, like uh, fuzz input guard. This is a structure that leases out access to the fuzz inputs. Is this what I want to do? I think so. This is going to have an A reference to a uh, fuzz input. And that's going to be um, A mute reference to a fuzz input. Uh, reference to the fuzz inputs. And then also uh, VM. This will be a, a mute reference to an IL VM this tc and we have to define those t and c okay reference to the vm these inputs belong to i think that should be fine okay looks good fuzz input we're gonna we should be able to derive default on this actually Nice. So fuzz input down here. Fuzz input. Okay. And then we're going to impl uh, pub fn fuzz inputs. Uh, get access to the fuzz inputs. This is going to be a fuzz input guard. And... Mute self. We'll make a new fuzz input guard that has a VM self and a fuzz input that. Uh, actually, self dot. Oh, is that going to be an issue? That might be an issue because we're kind of taking that out. Um, uh, I don't think. Uh, and that has two type arguments. So that's going to be uh, uh, T and a V, or T and a C. Expected reference. Yep, it's not a reference. Yeah, we can't borrow that twice. Um, I can maybe make the fuzz inputs. I can put them in an option. And then this will be a none. Then we don't care about defaults. Start off at n as none. Then, yeah, I, I like this more actually. Um, fuzz input there. De uh, default here. So we're gonna do. Uh, let fuzz input is equal to self dot fuzz input dot take. And then we're gonna pass that into here. And I'm going to say if fuzz input dot is none. Um, uh, if there's no existing fuzz input, create one. So I can do take dot unwrap or uh, default. And that does everything. And then I guess that's going to actually get ownership of... So that's no longer our reference here. So that's going to be a, a fuzz input. Nice. And this needs to be uh, public. So does that. Okay. So when we go to get the fuzz inputs here, we're going to take that. Then we're going to return this guard. And then when that returns, then we'll impl drop for fuzz input guard. Obviously, we're going to need these fields, T, C. Uh, impl this. 
I don't think I need the lifetime reference on there. Uh, yep, and then uh, fm drop mute self. And then here we'll do vm, or we'll do self.vm equals dot fuzz input is equal to sum fuzz inputs. Put the fuzz input back in the uh, vm. Nice. Uh, and this is self.fuzz input. And probably need to take that. Oh, it's not going to like that. Um, move occurs. Yep. Doesn't implement copy, which it won't. Uh, we also might need to put that in an option so we can take it. Uh, dot take. And then down here where we create it, this will just be a sum. One eighty three. Wait, what? I put the option on the wrong thing, didn't I? Yeah, I did. Okay. Okay, so that fuzz input will be overwritten, and then print uh, need to compute hashes. So this will give you access to the inputs, and then when you no longer need them then you will um, cause the hashes to get computed, uh, which means that the hashes will always be up to date and we won't need to hash them every time coverage occurs. Okay, so need to compute hashes. So in our program, when we do fuzz, we're gonna do vm.fuzz inputs, and we're just gonna scope this. We're gonna do uh, let inputs is equal to this, and I think I think that should just do the trick. Okay, need to compute hashes. Um, you know what? Maybe I don't want the hashes computed every time. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, maybe this was a stupid idea. I was wondering when does the JIT kick in in the emulation process? Is it when it reaches an instruction which has not been lifted yet. Uh, yes, it's basically every time I execute something that I, I have not lifted, that's it. Um, there's no, there's nothing that like looks ahead and tries to lift things uh, preemptively. Okay, this whole thing might have been dumb. Uh, we're gonna just do this. Uh, fuzz inputs, we don't need hashes here. Honestly, we can now just put this in the, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a dumb idea. And the reason for that is that would have caused a hash computation every every fuzz case rather than during coverage, which is r not going to happen every fuzz case. So this actually is, is better. Um, fuzz input here. Our fuzz inputs. Call it that. Fuzz inputs. This is going to be a reference to that. Okay, so that's going to be a vec new vector with then we'll get fuzz inputs mute uh get mutable access to the fuzz inputs mute uh vec u8 and vector width okay and then this will be mute self dot fuzz inputs Technically, I can just make this public, actually. Making it public makes more sense. Um, don't need getters and setters. There's no invalid states for these fuzz inputs. So then we'll do vm.fuzz inputs. Uh, and we don't have anything to do yet in our fuzzer. All right, so we just deleted like all of our code. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's always a good feeling. <laughs> uh, copy's not implemented for that. Uh, yeah, in this case, I think we are, we're just going to have to, it's it's kind of annoying, but we're just going to have to do this eight times. Okay. Uh, okay, that looks good. Now we have fuzz inputs. 
there, and then when we go to record coverage, we're going to have to have a database of input hashes. Um, okay, so we have coverage occurred here. We update that that exists, and then inside of here, we're going to have to, um, we're going to do like, Hmm. We're going to rep record one of the inputs that caused this to occur. We know that um, all the VMs online caused the same coverage. Uh, actually, we don't always know that. We'll improve it when we add register coverage, because register coverage will have some like really, really weird edge case behaviors here. So we're going to do uh, self. Uh, we're going to do self. Um, add input. And we need one input to add. So this is going to take a slice to an input to add to the input database. And then we're going to get the hash of it. So, and then that will take the hash. So for add input, that's going to take a reference to one of the VMs that that's online. So what I want to do is I want to go through... Uh, we know that the, the faulted VMs, is it? The resulting online. So, or actually caused VM exit, I think we have. Yeah, caused VM exit. So code coverage occurs on, on these VMs. So we'll want to do for uh, ID and caused VM exit. And this is in vectorize source this. I think I might implement iterator on these. Maybe not. This is mask. Um, single iter. Oh, I do have iter. So I can do dot iter. And then we're going to add that input and then we're going to break. So at least one VM had to have caused the exit. So we're going to uh, print, uh, we'll record the input for self.fuzz inputs um, ID. Um, and I might have to just hash that. I'm not sure. Uh, it's not going to like that because I'm passing a reference to that. So we're going to say add input ID. That will work. And now we're going to make a new function. Uh, pub fn add input mute self uh, vm id u size adds the fuzz input associate associated with VMID into the coverage data, uh, into the input database and re database and return the hash. So this will be a U128. And we're gonna need to go get a hashing library. We're gonna grab that from uh, TKO Fuzz Franzia uh, shared full cache. Okay, now we're gonna have a hasher uh, Franzia, um, oops, this is, a uh, um, soft serve, put it in here, and we'll make Volcal Cargo Tommel, pull in full cache. Okay, so, let hash is equal to self dot, uh, fuzz inputs vmid, and then this will be, like, self dot hasher, that or uh, self dot falk hash dot hash reference to the fuzz inputs and then we're gonna have to make a use full cache full cache I think is what I call it um, this is an aisle session we're gonna do uh, full cache is equal to this um, access to a full cacher Full cash, full cash, new. Uh, no full cash in the read. Okay. And oh, full cacher. Okay. Nice. Full cacher, full cash. Perfect. 
Okay, unknown field, that's on 268, that's on self. Um, we actually want to add this on the aisle session. So here, we'll add it, and we have a reference to self. We don't have a mutable reference to self, but everything should be fine here. And then this will take a... Um, I guess now this can take an input. Nice. Adds the fuzz, adds the input to the uh, input database and returns the hash. Okay, now we're just gonna hash this. Nice. Not fun on aisle session. Uh, 432. Yep, this is going to be on aisle session. Add input based on self.fuzz inputs ID. Nice. Okay, so that's uh, looking good there. And this should just work. It's not really doing anything yet because it's not actually adding the input to the database, but it is correctly assigning the uh, coverage um, to map to this input. So we know that a, a certain coverage event can be associated with uh, a given input. Um, but now we need to make an input database and an input database. We're going to have two things here. We're going to have an input DB. This is going to be, uh, this is basically a filter. So input database that tracks which inputs we've seen so far and then we're going to actually have inputs uh and this will be a i really want atomic vec let's see if i have that in um waffle cone oh i don't have waffle cone um oh hmm hmm Hmm. Okay. Damn. I thought I had that, uh, thought I had that code. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do inputs. This is gonna be a vector, a vector of U8s. Actually, it can't be that this is going to be a vector of options of vectors of u8s and it's going to be a fixed size so it will be uh um we'll make a constant constant uh input database size u size is equal to this size of the input database Okay, and then vec u8, there we go. So database of all um, inputs. And then here we'll add a, um, this will do an inputs in use atomic u size. And I don't know if we pull that in. We don't uh, use standard sync, atomic, this, and ordering. So inputs in use, database of all inputs, uh, number of inputs currently in the input database. Okay. And we're gonna split that again, just so we can reference that structure. So here we'll do a, uh, we don't need that comment. It's pretty obvious what it's doing. We'll do input DB. That will hold input database size. Then we're gonna have inputs in use, atomic U size, new zero. And then we'll have inputs, and this will be a I might, I might throw this in a box. 
Uh, I can make this a vector here. We can make this a vector. And what we'll do is it will be none times this. So inputs, inputs, and use, and that. Because keep in mind, we're going to have to we're gonna have to write some unsafe code here uh, to fill in these inputs. So we have the input database. Add input. So when we have an input, we're going to do a self.input.db.fetch or insert. And this will take hash hash, because the key and the hash are the same value. Then we'll do a match on this, OK. This is the input is already in the database. In the error case, then we will, um, in this case, we will do a let input ID is equal to uh, self.inputs in use dot uh, fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent. So this will be uh, get a new unique identifier for the input. Then we're going to do inputs, input ID. Um, uh, dot as mute pointer. And this should be let input is or as pointer. We're going to do some crazy stuff here. Uh, this is going to be a constant evacuate. Um, honestly, we want this to be atomic pointer. That's what we're going to do. And atomic pointer we can implement up here. Oh, atomic pointer I don't think implements um, a copy. So we're going to do a, a atomic use size here. Database of all inputs. These point to um, ooh, with vectors, we're going to need uh, we're going to need an input and a size. For a vector. Okay, database of all inputs. Okay, and then here we can do uh, inputs, input ID. So we get a new unique identifier for the input. We're then going to update in the input database. We're going to uh, dot zero dot store, and this is going to be the pointer to that. So we're going to um, Allocate a box to hold. The, uh, allocate a box to hold the input. Let um, input box is equal to a box new of inputs. Um, and honestly, we won't need the size in that case. I don't think so. Here, this will be an atomic u size zero. Okay, nice. Okay, then we're gonna do a store of input box dot, and I don't know if leak has been stabilized yet. There's a um, rust up doc. They're adding a, a function called leak, but I don't think it's stable yet. But it's on boxes and it allows you to like consume and get immutable. Actually, we can just do into raw in this case. Um, box into raw, and that. So we're going to do store box into raw of input box. So allocate a box to hold the input and update the input database. And then all we need to do is hash ent here. We just need to fill this in with a box new of the hash. Update the entry in the hash table. So we get the a unique identifier, we update, we store, and we leak that. I don't really care about leaks because this database will never get freed. So we're just going to into raw the input. So we make a copy of the input, and we throw it in there. And I think that might be fine. Uh, this might need to be a box. I need to make sure that this is a, a slice and not a reference to a slice. I'm going to strictly type that. Um, this will be self.inputs. Clones not implemented on atomic U size. Oh my god. Um, I 
Um, then 683. Box leak has been stable for a while. Okay, box leak has. I think vector leak is the one that hasn't. Yeah, vector leak is still... Yep, that's the one that's still uh, not stable yet. But in this case, I, I actually just want the into raw. So, the clone's not implemented there. That's easy. Store, this needs a... Uh, uh, Ordering sequentially consistent. Um, hash ent here. That can't be dereferenced. De this is a uh, dot update. Um, dot update. It's not update. It's a uh, fetcher insert. Um, insert. Okay. Into raw. Uh, expected use size found out that. Uh, so that's going to be as use size. No problem. And then we have expected slice found that. So uh, how do you convert uh, new? I feel like there's a like into box or like dot boxed for slices. Um, into box slice, boxed, into box string, into box bytes. Let me see if there's a for Alex slice box. Oh, slice primitive box into vec. Not quite. Into box slice. I can do that from vector. There's into box slice on a vector, but I don't have a vector in this case. I mean, I could make a vector and then turn it into a box slice. It's kind of it's kind of gross, but I can do like a um, vec from that, and then dot into boxed slice. Kind of gross, but I don't actually think there's a huge overhead to that. Okay, um, sixty six. Um, casting that. To U size is invalid. Must cast through a thin pointer. Yep. Um, as const uh, U8 as U size. That's fine. And then this one we can fix. It's kind of gross. We're going to have to do uh, let mute inputs. Or here I can do inputs is equal to like zero dot dot. Um, Input database size dot map x vec or er, vec new. Uh, oh, it's not vec new. It's uh, atomic u size new zero dot collect. Kind of gross. So let inputs is equal to that. And then these inputs I can throw here. That should do the trick. Okay, so that should be good. I think it's already working. So uh, print allocated and inputs with hash x into entry this, and this will be hash and then input id. I actually might make that hash table, um, this is actually going to, the value for this is going to be, um, the value is an index into the inputs uh, vector. That makes more sense. This will take an input ID. So now I can look up through the hash table from a hash, I can get the input ID associated with that hash. Okay, so... 
Um, basically all that uh, code coverage. So that scrolled off the screen. So here we can get rid of this. And now I can go to uh, the print routine here. And now I can add like, um, uh, let's do eight inputs and then like eight coverage. So this will give us statistics of the coverage to database size and the input database size. This will be, um, we should have access to the aisle session. Yeah, perfect. So aisle session dot input db dot len and uh, dot coverage db dot len. So this will tell us the number of unique inputs in the database and the, and the unique coverage in the database. Um, okay. And now I'm going to start getting rid of some of these prints because we know our um, uh, 6502 lifter, this is like, oops, uh, SP um, Falkyle 6502 source uh, prints. We don't need the verbose prints in here anymore. Good. And I'll thread spawn. I don't really need that either. Uh, that's the trace stuff. Uh, oops. Okay, let's go through all the prints. We don't need these this print anymore. Um, that print will keep for for a second. And we have that print, and that's the trace buff, which we're not using right now. They're looking for feedback on what people would want to see in the language. Ooh, I've got, I've got like two huge things that I'd really like added to the language. Um, so if they're actually taking feedback, I might, I might do that. Okay, so... We push that, we see the before and after optimizations. I don't even need those stats. Um, that is in, where is that? Where do I, where do I print that? Um, uh, let's see rg dot dot or rg for oh that's gonna be in the actual optimized function uh full chaos, uh source aisle graph mod optimize and then this will be like const verbose bool equals false if verbose then this okay and then we'll do that down here if if verbose for tab that in oops whoa ah If for both, and I set that equal to false, good. Okay, now it's going to look really clean. So we've got just the statistics now. We have the, uh, we created one input with entry zero. Obviously, since we're not using inputs, this is the hash for uh, for an empty, empty vector into entry zero. We have one input in our database, and we have 140 coverage entries. And our performance looks solid here. We're not we're not really hurting performance with the coverage stuff. Um, sweet. Okay. So then, when these prints occur, oh man, I I fuck I fucking love coding, dude. When things start like taking shape, makes me so happy. Like yeah, it's been a it's been two hours of streaming to get coverage in, but we're getting like extremely fast low cost coverage uh in two hours that just that makes me so happy like how cool is that and this coverage is set up to handle um 
this coverage is designed to set, uh, to handle memory and register coverage when we add those. So, uh, then in the print, so we no longer need this. I know that stuff's working. Uh, store, uh, fetch add that. We just store that, box it, box it up. Okay. So then down here, we've got the print, and in this print situation, we're going to also have a... Um, actually, before we grab the lock, I'm going to enumerate all the inputs. Um, and the fetch add, the inputs aren't actually in the database yet. Um, sweet. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me make note of that so I can reach out to them. I've got something that like literally all my coworkers have been asking for. And I brought it before, and they're like, not many people need this. And I'm like, I'm, every single person I've ever convinced to use Rust has complained about these, like, one or two things. So uh, Rust uh, 2020 feedback. Do you have a link or anything for that of where to, like, give that feedback? So... And, and the things I want to add are, are like a thousand lines of code added to Rust. So I'm, I'm not asking for some like crazy feature. I'm, uh, mainly I want casting. I want casting built into the language supported uh, for types that don't have padding bytes and are only plain old data. Like I should be able to read a file, right? I should be able to make a structure and we'll say like repper packed. I should be able to make a structure that has like foo u8 bar u128 baz i size and i should be able to cast a slice that contains um uh size of struct bytes i should be able to cast that or not necessarily cast it casting requires alignment uh runtime checks but cloning i want like a cast into where i can do this um and i can have like struct is equal to this this is always safe, and this can be proven to be safe. If every if there are no padding fields in a structure, and every field is plain old data or a structure that contains plain old data, so no padding, and every root value is plain old data, you should be able to do a cast into where it would basically uh, perform that operation 100% safely. There, there's no situation where this is unsafe. So I want, I want cast into that would make a copy of this data and then into a structure. That way struct can have different alignment properties. Um, so like I can take any slice. So I can take a slice of any bytes and I can cast it, uh, cast, uh, I actually call it like cast copy. Um, so this would allow you to like create a copy of these bytes in a structure initialized to these bytes and it's always safe. So the other thing I want is um, this as well. I want the ability to cast a slice. Um, and all types that, so this should be like a drive uh, castable. And basically any structure that derives castable, so implement castable on like the, the plain old data types, and then things can inherit castable, and they would just have to not have padding. And then I also want an ability to do this, where I can take a slice of things, they could be bytes, but any castable value, and then do a cast on it. And this is not always safe because sometimes the alignment of the bytes does not line up with the alignment of the structure. And in that case, have a runtime check. I want this to panic. So I would want this to panic if alignment is bad. And then I would also want a um, try cast. And then I, I could handle that error myself. Um, yeah, it's basically tr uh, transmute copy with some more sugar. Um, let me see transmute copy. That's unsafe, right? Yeah. So all the transmutes are unsafe. All I want is a transmute support for, for types that are proven to not have any incorrect states. And like one of the things that gets brought up here is what do you do about Indianness? And my answer is I don't really care. Like you could make these take an Indianness field. They, they could take an Indianness field. Like if you want to do that and then it would like perform the swaps on all of these. But to me, I don't really care because there's no there's me no memory corruption that could occur from interpreting a big Indian value as a little Indian value. There's no unsafety there. Um, it could produce incorrect results, um, 
And you could maybe argue that that's undefined behavior, but it's well-defined. It's like if you're a little Indian architecture and you treat big Indian bytes as little Indian, it's a defined behavior that they're going to be backwards. Um, so I would really like this. There's a library out there called byte order that gets close to this. And every time I've asked for this from the language, they're like, oh, just use byte order. I'm sorry. A language that's designed for systems development needs to be able to cast fucking like slices to other types safely when it knows it's safe. Like, yep, if there's a pointer in here, if there's a reference in here, if there's a vector in here, obviously you can't derive castable. But castable should just be implemented for all types that implement pod, and you should get pod. Um, you should be able to derive any complex structures where this could, like, have itself in here. Um, obviously, this is, like, a recursive reference, but, like, it could be another struct that implements castable. Um, I have a library, or technically a procedural macro that does this. Uh, I call it safecast. So, um... But I don't want to have to maintain this. I don't want to have to implement... I don't want to have to maintain this when the language could maintain this uh, internally and encourage people to use this. And then this means anyone who's writing a parser, like if you want to parse a PE file, you just make the structure for the PE, you read the bytes, and then you cast it, and you're done. And it's safe in all situations, well-defined behavior, um, and it has, like, zero cost. It's literally a mem copy internally, and if you do the actual cast itself, um, there's truly zero cost. It, the compiler literally will just access the original slice. So this is what I have. I have, like, cast copy into. Um, so I have, like, this byte safe trait that is auto-derived for structures that are only byte safe. Here I do, like, the cast copy into. Here I have my cast copy. So cast copy into copies into a destination. Um, cast copy returns a T, uh, and it uses cast copy into internally. So it like makes an uninitialized field, cast copies into it, returns. I have cast. Here I have alignment checks and divisibility checks. So I make sure that I can cast any type to any type of the slice sizes. Um, and then cast mute, I have a mutable way of casting as well. Same thing, just make sure alignment is, is runtime checked. Uh, and you could have try cast and all these different things. So um, this is 430 lines of code, mainly because I have 256 lines of impulse. So it's like 200 lines of code. The procedural macro for this is in uh, byte safe derive. The procedural macro is 100 lines of code. I'm basically asking for Rust to maintain 300 lines of code that would basically... Like, right now, when people want to cast, they're either pulling in a third-party dependency, which, I'm sorry, I don't want to use a third-party dependency when I want to just cast values. That's, that's way too much. That's way too much. And byte order, I don't think, works with structures. I think you have to go field by field. On the flip side, people will use Serde and do, like, serialization and deserialization, which is a massive hammer when all they need is, like, a, a mem copy of bytes. Um, and I know Serde optimizes to that, but that, once again, has like 30 dependencies. I'm not pulling in 30 dependencies into my kernel just so I can, like, cast a slice of bytes that I got from the network into an IP header. I, it's just... that The quality of life there would be huge, and almost every single person I've ever worked with has complained about that not being in the language. So I'm hoping that we can push that through... That would basically be like 300 to 400 lines of code that they would have to implement. You just have to impl, you have to unsafe impl the like um, castable on like the primitive types, like the U8 through I128, like all of those different types. And then you have to have a derive that just checks, make sure everything has no padding bytes, because padding bytes would be unsafe. You can't cast a structure that has padding into a vector because now you have access or a slice of bytes, because now you have access to padding fields. Um, but that's fine. I can make it safe by manually padding out my structures in the code, which would cause them to get initialized. Um, it would be huge to add that. It would be great for binary file parsing. It'd be great for writing network protocol parsing. It would be great for um, internally just like casting things around. Um, and it would be designed for working with data. This isn't like, I'm not asking for C-style castings, which are massively unsafe. 
this would be provably safe in all situations. So um, that's something I really want to bring up. And I don't think it's that complex. Um, I, I think the language would benefit a lot from it. And uh, for the systems people who use the language, casting is fundamentally required. So I would love to see that direction. So that's my little mini rant. That 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 is by far my biggest complaint with Rust. I I do basically everything I do is working with binary files. So like if you're writing a fuzzer in Rust, you have to manually like deserialize it by like doing from LE bytes on every field. You have to implement your own like offsets. Maybe talk to Josh. Okay. Um I might just like write a blog on this and talk about like what I did as a solution and kind of like how I've had so many coworkers have this problem and all of the situations where you have this issue and how it's really not that much more code for Rust to maintain. Because I recognize that's a big thing. Like I, when someone says like, hey, I want async added to Rust, that's a big deal. And, and yes, we should get async and it's obviously it's coming or it's like already here kind of. Um, but I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for like 500 lines of code that's really not strenuous on the developer. Someone could add this in probably a day and then maintaining it would have zero cost indefinitely because you're not adding more primitive types. You're, you have the same amount of primitive types forever. So um, I, would, I would love to see that change. And then you could have functions that would take in like, uh, in the case of my like MMU, I have like read and write routines. Um, and my read routine, uh, fn read int, this takes a, um, it takes in bytes as a T and the T is anything that implements safe cast. And that means I can directly just, I it, like, it's totally fine for me to do like VM dot write and then like struct, uh, one, two, three. And it will know like that is castable. It'll convert that to bytes and then it will end up writing those bytes into memory of the VM. It's, I love it. It should all be trait based and then other people can build templates using that. So like all of the things that actually write to files could actually take something that implements that. And then that would allow you to just automatically like any plain old data you can just write to a file and you don't have to like write multiple lines of code to, to do it. Um, so I'd love to see that. Okay, where are we at after that rant? Um, uh, I was going to save the, the fuzzing database. So print here. So before I get the lock, so the lock is going to prevent other threads from doing things. So I want that lock only held basically for the time that I need to print this information. In fact, I should actually make a copy of the information and then drop the lock because the print's going to take a long time and I don't want to have that lock held. Um, I think I can actually drop it. Uh, let instructions is equal to stats.instructions. So all I'm doing is I'm getting fields from there. And then here I should be able to do standard mem drop um, stats. And this is uh, release the lock so the print doesn't stall worker threads. Obviously, we're only printing every second, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, Stats that fuzz cases. Yep. Equals stats dot fuzz cases. So I just try to be really courteous with my locks. I, I try to just drop. Um, if I have a lock and I no longer need it, I try I try to drop that and, and give up give up CPU time to or give up that lock to other threads. So this how this now has like zero cost. So and we do it every second, so it's not a big deal. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to dump the coverage information. And uh, to do this, I need to iterate all of the coverage. And I think I think I added some fancy stuff in full cache. Um, I think there is inside of full cache structures, or not full cache, um, AHT. So inside of here, I have a hash table, which is the, the raw hash table. And then I have a contiguous table, which is a list of all pointers. 
Um, this allows me to iterate the, the table. And let me see um, where I use this. So there I store it, there I get contig, uh, get for index. And that, uh, okay, so I don't have an iterator on there, but I have, I have close to it. So I can do for um, input ID in uh, IL session dot input db dot len. So for each input identifier, then we're gonna let input is equal to um, or this is on coverage. So on coverage DB coverage, we're going to get the uh, PC and info. And we're going to get that from coverage dot uh, aisle session dot coverage DB dot get and then index. And we don't have to worry about race conditions here because if like technically it, um, Technically, we might miss a few entries here, but that's fine. We'll get them on the next run. So let PC info is equal to this. Um, and this is going to block if that entry is not um, present. So this actually, I, if let sum, because this is failable. Uh, if we were able to get an entry, then we'll print the PC and the info for that hash entry. I think that's how I designed this code. Uh, that returns a value, coverage DB. Oh, the value in the coverage DB. Yeah, um, we're gonna add uh, coverage DB. This is going to take a uh, that um, uh, value is the input hash. PC and info. So this will be uh, hash PC info. Okay, and we're gonna have to update that where we insert it, 435. We should have all of that information here when we go to add it, uh, PC info. And I think that will plumb everything through. Okay, so that's printing our coverage database every second, which is which is great. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a, um, I'm gonna see if I can produce the uh, correct style for, um, you know, we're actually gonna need to make our own uh, coverage uh, coloring thing for Ida because we are going to, um, we're gonna end up having some like special colors for, for different things. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is, okay, we don't need AHT, coverage database here. And I'm gonna say, let mute last coverage is equal to like, uh, you know, we'll just, we'll just dump the whole thing to a file every time right now. So we'll do let uh, coverage string is equal to string new, uh, mute coverage string plus equals format and reference. And then we'll do a uh, standard FS write coverage dot text coverage string. Yeah, it's not too fast, but I don't really care. Uh, expect a coverage file, uh, failed to write coverage file. Okay. So we're gonna dump that to a file every second. So technically I can make a differential where it only logs things that it hasn't previously logged to the file. I can make it append to the file instead. There's a lot of things I can do, um, but right now we're not working with large enough co coverage numbers where it's really worth implementing that. Um, not that it's that much work, uh, but hey, you should start with what's easy. So we should have a on the server now. Um, here, we should have a coverage.txt, and we do, it has one line, that looks incorrect. Um, that new, uh, if let that, oh, we probably, did we just um, go through each thing, coverage string plus equals that, write it out. Why is that only one line? 
Uh, covered string is a new st Oh, 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 jeez. Wow. Yep. Yep. Okay. Done. Fixed. Okay, now it's right. Okay. So now we have all the coverage information going to this, and we have the coverage and the info. Nice. So that means I can now make an Ida script. Uh, we're going to make something called color color.py, and man, I, I have color.py probably in like 30 of these folders, but I, I don't know. Ah, uh, you know, I think I have it in, um, uh, I think I have it here. Uh, Mesos. Um, coverage scripts, ida.py. What's this? Code navigation? Navigate your code? Okay, interesting. So that takes the coverage.txt to your script directory. And uh, yeah, this will this will get us ballpark. Um, this will get us roughly what we want. So we're going to make a uh, color.py. And, okay, let's take a look. So this is going to add us to block. That's going to get a function, going to get the flow chart, try to look up the block. So this is for block coverage. We're not doing a block coverage right now. Um, we're not doing that. So get the coverage directory, read it to a file, go through all of the functions, go through all of the blocks, uh, that might go through all the instructions. So that should clear all of the um, coverage information, go through frequencies, parse the coverage file, fft.finditer. So what was fft? That was our regex. So we're going to do, uh, uh, we have an, uh, okay. So we've got that plus, and then we'll put that in parens. And we've got this. That is our coverage uh, file shape right now. Yep. So OX, A through no, uh, 0 through 9, A through F, lowercase, good. Um, perfect. What do I do here? I do a lot of fuzzing work and security research. So right now we're adding code coverage, which will tell us the code that is written to or the code that is used to handle a given input. Um, okay, so we're gonna get the uh, we're gonna get the offset, which is group two, uh, or we're gonna get PC, which is gonna be uh, group one, and we're gonna get the info, which is this group. We're not using info yet. Okay. Apply coloring. Um, that's for frequency tracking. Yeah, we're just gonna do this. We're gonna set at PC. We're gonna set the color to COCOCO. I think that's a decent color. Uh, parse the coverage file and set the colors. That will reset the coverage. Okay, I think this should maybe kind of work. Maybe, kind of, maybe kind of. So we got color.py, whack that in there. Let's see if that, uh, oops, well that's, that wasn't what I wanted. I'll get rid of that and jit examples. Okay, 6502, good. This, 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 this. I swore I changed that font size, 12. Okay, that's better. Uh, we define this as a function. And I should be able to point this to this. I uh, couldn't find coverage.txt. Yep. So we'll we'll just uh, we'll just take a couple of these lines and we'll make uh, coverage. Okay. And we'll see if this works. Uh, dot dot coverage. Okay. Well, 
We just want this. Okay, so that looked like that worked. Um, okay, and then I'm just gonna delete these lines and hopefully it should clear everything. Okay, looks good. Okay, so now I just need to grab that coverage file off the server to get the whole thing. So I'm just gonna make a uh, SCP. Uh, I just have another terminal on a, another monitor. Um, LK uh, coverage dot text dot. Okay. And uh, lost connection. Uh, SCP that. Okay, so that will give me coverage.txt, copy it into here. And now we can get the uh, coverage uh, colored in in Ida. So obviously this is, that's actually an old program. So let's grab the, the newest program that we're actually running. This one, boom, boom, boom. Doop, 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 doop. Okay, so now we should be able to see all the coverage in these routines. Looks good. Obviously, we're covering everything in this case. Sweet. So now we have code coverage. What's up, Barber Shopper? How you doing? Okay, so now that we have that coverage being printed in a nice human format, let's implement an application uh, with a bug, which is most C applications. And we're just going to do, um, we're going to get an input. We're going to allocate, uh, um, hmm. I think if we, we're, we're going to put some, we're going to put an input in the data section. So this input is going to be 10 hex bytes. Actually, I want to allocate this input. So we're going to get the input, uh, so this will be the like global input is equal to this uh, constant. And this will be equal to zero. We'll initialize it to zero. And then we'll have const size t global input len is equal to, let's say just, oh, uh, we'll say eight. We're gonna do eight hex bytes. Then I'm gonna do a input is equal to malloc eight. And then I'm gonna do a uh, mem copy input from global input for global input len, and this will be this. Okay, so this will copy us to the heap, so we'll have the like um, ASAN sort of stuff where we'll get those protections. So by putting it on the heap, we get we get better we get better protections on it. Um, okay. Okay, so that's building the application, and now we should be able to deploy. And everything should work just fine. We're, we're given that allocation now. Obviously, the coverage numbers have changed because the application has changed. So now I'm going to implement um, if we're going to basically implement. Uh, um, we're just going to do like a bunch of compares byte at a time. This is like this is like the stereotypical thing that um, that people write to demonstrate code coverage. So we're gonna get from input at zero, if this is equal to uh, h, um, and we're gonna just do hello. Hello. So fuzzers pretty much will never be able to find this bug without code coverage because it is a five byte comparison. So this is comparing five different bytes and then we're just gonna do a uh, um, uh, volatile character OX uh, foob is equal to five. Okay, so we're never gonna find this crash with, with our fuzzer right now, mainly because we're not actually generating that input um, at all yet, so... Um, Okay, we have global input, global input length. We're searching for hello, one byte at a time. And obviously it's not crashing because we're not 
we're we're actually just providing zero. So if I if I change this, if I did like a stir copy over input of hello, this should now crash when I build it. So this will crash every time, of course. Yep, crashing because it's accessing foob. But if I don't do the stir copy, this is not going to crash because it's it's never going to find that path. It well, we're not mutating yet, but. Okay, so now we need to find where global input and global input length are stored in memory. Um, uh, I could inject the input after the malloc. Um, I'm just going to put them into these two globals. So let's see where those are in IDA. Uh, we'll copy the program. Doop. Doop, doop. Okay, and we'll have P. Okay, this is going to be um, okay. So these are the bytes right here. So E two, someone someone's going to be accessing E two. Yeah, E two, uh, two and E two is where that's going to be. Um, Problem is that's gonna move around a lot in the in the section there. So what I'm gonna do, hmm, hmm, since the data section, since the data section is gonna move around, I guess I know where the data section is. Otherwise, I can like have that trap up. Um, basically, I just need to know where to inject the input. So here we're gonna um, here's our fuzz implementation, and we're gonna do vm dot uh, fuzz inputs. I think, yeah. So for input in dot iter mute fuzz inputs mute. Um, okay, I think that should work. Uh, fuzz inputs. Oh, yeah, we just made it public. That makes sense. So we'll go through each of the inputs. And then we're going to corrupt them up. Um, and we're going to corrupt them in the same way. So we're actually going to make one input here. We're going to do input is equal to an OU8, um, 8. Uh, we'll actually go to 5 because we know it's 5 bytes. So we're going to go... Uh, we're going to have... We're going to corrupt one random byte in this input. Um... Uh, we need a, a get input here uh, on aisle session. Um, and I think these, I think I have an aisle session accessor. An aisle VM, do I store the aisle session? I think I do. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not. I might need to put a reference to the aisle session in here. Um, yeah, I will need to do that, which means I'm, I'm going to need to wrap a lot of things in an arc. So let mute, uh, oops, uh, we already have arc, aisle session, because this is where our databases are going to be. I can actually put them in statistics. Uh, nope. Huh. Yeah, I don't have that aisle session in the aisle VMs. So anywhere that I use an aisle session, I actually have to pass it in. So we're going to do this run and struct aisle vm this is now going to have an aisle session session this this will be an arc session this vm belongs to and we need to implement the y and what do we do for y this
It might not like that C, actually. Um. Shit, how do I want to do this? One second, I gotta get some more water. I'll be right back. Okay. So, ah, oh yeah, I forgot that we had this problem. Damn it. Um, basically, we need to have access to the coverage database from the VMs. And right now, we don't have that. And let me see. I could just pass the aisle session to the functions, I think. That's because the callback should get invoked here. So... Where are the callbacks? Uh, fuzz is called in the parent function. So fuzz, uh, fuzz callback. Okay, so here we, where we do the fuzz callback. Oh, uh, session dot context dot. Um. That's the global context. I think I'm just going to want to pass in the aisle session here. Aisle session is probably already a reference. Yeah, it's an arc aisle. Okay. Okay, fuzz callback expected two parameters. We're going to need to make that take a TYC. So we're just going to yoink. And down here. Um. For a fuzz callback, this is going to get a reference to an IL session TYC. Um, and a comma. Whew. Please, 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 please work. 964. Uh, I think if I do that, that will take care of that. Oh, I can also just borrow. That makes more sense. Okay, so now we have, yep, now we have access to an aisle session here. Um, this is going to take a uh, TYC and so aisle session target 6502. Um, I forget what these fields are supposed to be. Uh, we've got that wow this is gross 
We've got a target 6502. Then we have a Y, which is the... I think Y is the context, and C is the or global context. And this is the context. We can make types for those. Have you ever won any bug bounties? Yes. Okay. Um, TYC. Okay, we've got the aisle session in here. And now I'm going to do a get an existing input from the database. So we're going to do IL session dot, uh, cover, uh, dot get input. So that's going to get a random input. Um, uh, new, 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 new. So we want to get a random input. And I need a random number generator in here to do that. So let's, uh, I think I bring in a rand here. Do I have a random implementation in here? I have to. I have it in um, rand graph. Okay, that's calling random rand, which is terrible. Random rand is way too slow. But we will grab this. Oops. We'll grab this quick. That will seed our RNG because that will be a good random value. So I'm gonna make a. Uh, we're gonna make a pub struct rng uh, a random number generator I guess that's an aisle session get get input get get a random input um we're gonna actually we can do this down here Seed is going to be a U size. We're going to do impl rng struct uh, fn new rng. This is going to return uh, rng, uh, and this should be self. This will be an rng with a seed, and the seed's going to be leet, 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 leet. Great seed. fn rand returns a U size. Uh, mutable reference. Actually, we're going to do an immutable reference, and we're going to put this in a cell. I've written this code so many times. Uh, use standard cell cell. Then we're going to do let's mute seed is equal to self dot seed dot get seed XOR equals seed 13, That's our RNG. Self dot seed dot set seed seed okay okay so then we're gonna create a new rng um i don't know i kind of want an rng provided to me by the ilvm i think i'm gonna do that so we're gonna do uh ilvm how you been doing it's been a long time yeah i'm doing good i'm just chilling so it's, it's a nice week had great weather all week, which has been awesome. Been going on a lot of bike rides. Uh, we've got ILVM. So in here, we're going to make our RNG. Make these public. That doesn't need to be public. We'll do RNG here. This can now have um, rand.random. Seed, or U size. OK, so then. We'll do a RNG is equal to RNG new seed. Oh, oh, huh. Well, well, aren't I surprised? I already have an implementation of an RNG. What are the odds of that? Pretty high, pretty much guaranteed actually. 
uh, seed in this case. How do we seed it? Uh, yep. Okay. So we're literally doing the same thing. Everything is the same here. Okay. So we're going to get input and then we're going to do self.rand or vm.rand. And then the aisle session. Impl aisle session. There we go. We're going to make a uh, pub fn get input self seed u size gets a random input from the coverage database. Gets a random input from the input database uh, based on seed. Based on seed. And then this will return a sum reference u8. Um, okay. And then for this, I will do let input db len, or we'll do uh, if self.input db.len is equal to zero, return none. Basically, uh, and we'll actually do this. Uh, no inputs in the data base can't get an existing input. Then I'll have our else case. And then here we're gonna do let index is equal to self.input db.len mod seed. And that will give me an index for an input for the input database. And then I'm going to get the, um, we're going to do, uh, then we will get the length there, which won't get updated. So this should always be in bounds. So then we'll do let pointer is going to be equal to a, um, Uh, this will be self.inputs of index. That's always in bounds. If it's not, obviously, Russell will, will fail. So that's great. Um, sorry for being off topic. What's the target I failed to find volumes in? That was a, uh, a Wi-Fi chipset on a phone. Um, it was just a, there was like no attack surface. There are only like uh, 500 or 1,000 basic blocks. And it was really stripped down. So Project Zero ended up finding bugs in basically the same surface. And when that blog came out, I was really sad. But then I found out that the uh, manufacturers actually turned features on and off. And all the features that they found bugs in were actually disabled. Um, so I mean, who knows if I would have found them. There's a chance that I would have missed them. But uh, the specific phone I was looking at actually didn't have, didn't have any of those enabled. So. That's kind of the RNG of security research. You like buy a device to do research against and then you like get unlucky because it's configured in like a weird way or really locked down or really restricted for, for what's implemented. So sadly, okay, we get this input. That's gonna give us uh, an atomic pointer. And then we're gonna cast that as a mute uh, u8. Um, and then we're gonna do a box from raw on that. So box, so this box should be exact, uh, we'll call it thing. This is box uh, u8. So this will get us access to that box again. So um, get access to to the input, and then we want to um, return a reference. And it's critical that we don't drop that box, so we have to return a sum, or this is option. We're gonna return a sum, thing.leak, which I think is stable for boxes. Um, this is an associated function. Yeah, so leak leak might actually not work for us because I think leak gives mutable access. Well, it's fine because um, 
it does give mutable access, but then we demote the thing here. So we're going to do um, box leak thing. So we created that thing, and we want to make sure that we don't drop it, and we're going to give a reference out. Um, casting a use size is that, so we're going to have to go through a... Uh, we're going to have to go through a... Whatever you want to call that pointer. Um, I actually don't know... Cannot cast a thin pointer to a fat pointer. Oh, da, 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 da. Is that true? When I'm working with the box, I think for boxes, this is safe. Oh, the box actually just has a pointer. Uh, I think the way we're doing this, we have to slightly change. Um, so we're going to do a box. Yeah, yep. The way we're doing this is, is slightly incorrect. Um, inputs. So these inputs here, oops. We'll need to change that as well. So inputs are going to be atomic U size, atomic U size. So it's gonna be the database of all inputs. This is gonna be pointer, this is gonna be the size. Uh, tuple is pointer size in bytes. Okay, then we go down to inputs here, and this just has to be uh, zero, zero. Perfect, and we'll put some uh, curlies there, do this stuff, make it nice and fancy. Boom, then inputs. Okay, down here we're gonna have an issue, so we actually are going to want to, uh, we do want this as a vector. A vector bytes, so vector from the input, uh, input vect, and then we're going to store as pointer, as u size. Um, in fact, we can make these atomic pointers. So this will be an atomic pointer to uh, a u8. And then this will be atomic pointer new, standard pointer null mute. Okay, inputs. So we store the pointer, and then we're going to store the length. And then we're going to standard mem forget input vect. So then then it won't actually get dropped, because we if, if that drops, we have a stale pointer. So the length, and then uh, that's a dot zero, and this is a dot one. Um, and 66 and 710. 66, so this doesn't like, uh, yeah, we can say as mute pointer, just so it's happy. And then that's 710. This won't like it because, yeah, we're not doing any of this anymore. So this will now just be a, a U8. And we'll get this from an unsafe uh, standard slice from raw parts. And we're going to have the pointer come from here and the length come from here. Bada bing. And then return a reference. So that is just thing. Okay, and semicolon. Actually, we don't want... Where does it want a semi? Here. Yeah. Okay, and then this is a dot load ordering sequentially consistent. And this is the same thing. Nice. Okay, so now we're going to say uh, get an existing input from the database. We're going to say if let sum this, oops, if let sum input is equal to this. So we're going to try and get an existing input. 
And we're going to put in the context structure. Do we have mutable access to context? Yeah, context mute. So we're going to make a, in our context structure, we're going to have our input vec u8, um, input vector. This allows us to, um, do we have default on that? Yeah, we do. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do is vm dot, or let active input, or we're going to call this like mutate input. Mutate input is equal to vm dot context mute dot input. Going to get a mutable reference to that. We're then going to, we might not be able to call vm rand when we have this open. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, so we're going to get a random input. Oh, and we mod by, whoa, seed, seed mod that. And then here I'm going to do, okay, that's good. And up here, uh, I'm going to do where we do the store. I'm going to store the pointer last. And then that allows me to put an assertion down here. This is like really pedantic, but hey, I'm a big fan. We're going to do this, let pointers this, and then let len is equal to this. Assert uh, pointer dot is null. Uh, assert it's not null. Um, tried to access uh, null input. Okay, so get the pointer and length to the input, and then we're gonna make a casting of that, or we're gonna slice it up, pointer len. Easy. And then we return a reference. Okay, that is good. Now we just need a cell in here we get rid of. Down here we get the mutate input. We'll do mutate input dot clear, so we'll clear it out. And then in the case of a in the case that we have an existing input in the database, we'll do mutate input dot extend from slice input. That's basically copying an existing input. If we don't have an existing input, then we'll do mutate input dot extend from slice b a a a a a. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, it doesn't like that uh, borrow. So here we're going to do a dot take. We're going to put this in an option. Um, uh, take dot un unwrap or default. And then at the end, we're just going to put that back in there. So we're going to do uh, context mute dot uh, input equals mutate input sum. That's just going to keep the point around. Store the input back into the context. That makes sure that we don't perform an allocation in our hot loop because that would be too expensive. Um, allocations are just, uh, you, can't, you can't do an allocation 250 million times a second, so we wouldn't be able to fuzz at the speeds that we do. Um, Okay, that looks good. We're getting 40 million fuzz cases a second. And now we just need to inject this input in. So we'll do vm.mmu.write, right? Write force. We're gonna write force. And we're gonna write into that address, that global, uh, to an e2. So online. Uh, vert adder ox2 on e2, and we're going to write in the input, the mute, um, mutate input dot s slice. And we're going to assert that this is equal to, whoa, we'll do this. We'll assert that the write is equal to the um, mutate input dot len. Okay, make sure that or write in the input. Okay, so this will now modify, and we don't have online, so we'll do uh, let online is equal to vm.online. 
So we're going to write those inputs in. And obviously, we're still going to get uh, 97 coverage, which is our baseline. And now we're going to write some mutation. So we're going to do uh, we're going to do for this in zero dot dot uh, self dot uh, vm dot rand mod four. So we're going to corrupt up to four bytes, sometimes zero. Then we're going to get an index, which will be vm dot rand mod mutate input dot len, and we'll do mutate input idx is equal to vm dot rand as u8. So randomly flip up to four bytes. Look at that. Best fuzzer in the world. Um, and we got some division with zero. That's happening on um, get input. How's that happening? This should always be five length. Because the ones in the database should always be five. Let me see. Okay, how is that happening? Oh, because I'm not assigning the inputs. Um, fuzz inputs. Okay, then for this, we'll do um, four VM in uh, four fuzz input in VM dot fuzz inputs. Um, update the fuzz inputs in the VM such that the uh, coverage feedback can correctly save our inputs on our behalf. Then we're going to do fuzz input dot, uh, dot iter mute, and this will be clear, cleared out, and then we'll do fuzz input dot extend from slice mutate input. So basically we weren't, we weren't telling, we weren't telling the engine where it could find the inputs. Um, and then we want to store the input back into the context. Okay. Okay, so... Oh, that's a coverage-guided fuzzer. Whoops. <laughs> okay, so, to disable coverage... <laughs> to, di to disable feedback... <laughs> my bad. Um... To disable feedback, we're just we just want to have it always be this case. So I'm gonna say none. <laughs> I was like, how the fuck is that finding the fuck? <laughs> okay, so now it's not using feedback, uh, and what do you know? It doesn't find the bug. So you can see that the coverage is going up, and we'll probably see the coverage increase again. We'll probably see it. It increased because eventually it will like find the right pattern of a couple bytes uh, to mutate. Um, <laughs> so we'll see if that coverage binks up again. Um, so if we were to load this coverage file up, uh, let me copy that off the server. Doop. Okay, coverage has been synced down. Now I'm going to grab the coverage file here. Coverage, and we'll maybe see that uh, we're probably on the fourth byte right now, so we need a, a we have like a one in four billion chance of actually seeing the next coverage, um, which is uh, uh, yeah rare. <laughs> so here is our application. Hopefully, it's like relatively easy to read. So let's uh, let's go to two thousand. Okay, so here are all of our branches. Okay. So this is basically showing what our fuzzer has been able to do. It's been able to get past this first branch, which is comparing with uh, um, Hopefully I can get the character. Really? Can you not see the character representation? Oh, that's derefing. Oh, is it putting hello constant somewhere? Oh, we just got we just got another byte. So if we now look at coverage. If we reload coverage, we'll see that this block is now hit. So we're going through like one block at a time. And uh, we'll just whack this in. And there you go. So now that block has been hit. So um, basically, this is our comparison. We are The code that we wrote is going to compare each byte for H-E-L-L-O. And we have gotten through, uh, I don't know how many compares 
one, two, three, four compares, it looks like. So we actually brute forced the four billion case. We actually got really lucky with that. Um, we were able to get a, a four byte match uh, by randomly flipping things. And the fifth byte we'll actually never get because we only mutate up to four bytes. So this would take another 256 times as long. And this isn't really fair because this is just a really fast fuzzer. Mo like most, most fuzzers wouldn't be able to uh, get through it this fast. But if we turn on coverage, and effectively what's happening is that every time we get new code coverage, we then recognize something interesting happened and we save that input. And then when we go through to create a new input, we build off of an existing one. So we always start with A's as our input. Otherwise, if there's an existing input in the database, we will grab that input uh, from it. And then we'll use that input as the baseline to mutate on top of. And then in this case, um, honestly, I don't even think we see a print. Yeah, it immediately crashes. Like, it immediately gets through all of those... Yeah, I don't think we see a single print. Like, it finds the bug in literally milliseconds. Um, rather than if you had no feedback, it would never find the bug. Or in this case, it would have taken... Uh, this was running for probably like two minutes. It probably would have taken like four hours to find that bug. Um, so that is why coverage is important. So if we now grab the coverage file... Uh, we'll see that all of these cases will be hit. So coverage, oops. Um, we'll see that now all the blocks have been hit. And that's just code coverage. That's what it does. And that's what feedback does. And that's how easy it is to implement. Like we did that in three hours. We implemented a custom JIT that, uh, we implemented a custom coverage routine for a JIT that then gave us coverage. We plumbed it through in a convenient way with an API that allowed us to get existing inputs and it allowed us to find a bug in this shitty application uh, in milliseconds. Like we, I don't even, I don't even know how quickly we found it. It's, I don't even have a print by the time it finds the bug. <laughs> it's, it's just instant. Yeah, and if I ran it on the actual machine, so it didn't have the SCP time. Yeah. Right away, it just fine. Like that is why coverage is important, <laughs> and feedback. Feedback is important, not coverage. Gathering the coverage doesn't get you feedback. Um, so there we go. We now we now have a fuzzer for this shitty application, and it and it works great. And we're getting um, a lot of faults. So, in this case, I would probably want to have them save the crashes to disk and like do all that stuff, and and I'll add that some other time. Maybe I could add that now. I mean, eventually I'm going to need that. I need to classify crashes um, so I know what crashes I'm getting. But let's get rid of the... Let's turn off the eye count tracking. And if I switch to block coverage, it would be the same effect. Uh, I actually lost a VM there. And I'm not sure why. At the very top. What happened? There's a panic. Uh, I've tried to access null input. Okay, maybe I do have a race there. Um, I mean, good. See, that's why you put checks like that. Um, I think what I can just do here is I can say uh, while this is equal uh, dot is null. So that will spin. So wait for the input to be populated. Um, so basically that condition can happen if another VM finds coverage, adds it to the input database, and then this happens to be getting an input before that one actually fills it in. So if we look at like inputs in use here, um, we fetch add one. So we update the count of the inputs. I don't actually know how, uh, I think hash and I actually don't know kind of how that's happening because the length of this hash table shouldn't get updated until this insert. And by the time that insert is done, the this should be stored. But nevertheless, um, we can just spin. So, um, uh, while uh, dot star is null. So while it's null, 
loop, and then we get the pointer and the length, and by the time that's been filled in, both of these are now valid and we're safe. So, and we panicked because we, we, didn't, we didn't access a null pointer. What does coverage look like? It's it's just uh um it's it's just a hash table. It's just uh it's just random bits in a hash table. Um that's it. So I then record that coverage. Actually, I don't even record that. I don't even have Oh, I do have the PCs. I do have the PCs. It's it's PC and info tuples. Um but the way that it gets filtered in the JIT is actually like really, really cheap. Um, and the reason for that is the next bug. Well, it'll, you know, honestly, probably everything will go really fast on 6502 because they'll all be byte comparisons. But on a different architecture, like a 64 bit architecture, the comparisons might get batched into like a, a 64 bit compare, in which case code coverage doesn't get you anything because you need to get all the, all the bytes right correctly. So I actually have a, a way of handling that in vectorized emulation by tracking. So the way that we log coverage is we don't actually care about PCs. This is not a code coverage database. This is a coverage database, even though I probably type code coverage database all over this code base. Um, so if I take a look at uh, folk IL source IL graph JIT. So this is the implementation of, so the coverage stuff, um, that's basically performing the coverage on uh, instructions. And then when we get to, um, then we implement that in the code coverage JIT. And that is done uh, here. So basically what we do is we like, we take in a PC value and then like an information field we compute a hash on that using AES instructions, and then we look that bit up in a table, and then if it's never been reported before, we return out of the JIT, and then we actually look that up in a real table. So this is a this is a filtering function. This is not actually like the be all end all. If there's a hash collision, we just won't report the coverage. Whoop de doo, not a big deal. Um, but this means I can then in this info field, which we're not using right now, I can put further information. I can put in information about memory accesses. I can put in information about register store values. Um, and then that will allow me to use this to get coverage in any situation. So um, I don't know if I'm using the, uh, so in the set conditional and in the branch conditional, I would add uh, further coverage in there. Um, so both of these are gonna perform a comparison. And what I would do is I would implement something where this would log coverage on the number of bytes that match between X and Y. So at the end of these comparisons, we would know that like X um, equals Y was the comparison that was performed and like X and Y had three bytes in common at any location. And then that would allow me to break it down where I can solve the multi-byte comparisons. Um, Sadly, we can't, I can implement this right now, but it wouldn't work for 6502 because there aren't multiple bytes being used in the comparison. Um, but that's, that's what I use to kind of solve compares. Uh, and it works great. It, it works amazing. Just keep track of like for each PC that does a comparison, keep track of the number of bytes that matched before the comparison and then, and you can get smarter than that. You can take into effect like what the type of comparison is and you can use that to like determine these different things. All I need to do, since I have that extra info field, I just need to come up with some more information about, so the zero info field is PC coverage. And then the one info field could be like, the comparison was really close. Like it was seven bytes matched out of eight bytes. And then I could have two and three and four and five, and I can assign all these different coverage events, and they're used in the coverage table. All they do is they cause new inputs to get stored because they're unique events that occurred, and then that causes me to pick them up for feedback. And that's it. Like, there's no reason to have multiple databases, multiple things. It's just look up a bit for a unique event and then log the input for that unique event. And then you have associations based on the coverage stuff. Um, so that is something that 
that I implement in the vectorized stuff in my very original version like two years ago. I haven't implemented it here yet, but I could implement it in about 30 minutes now that I have the this function. All I have to do is call this function on, on those comparisons, and it, everything just works. Um, so that's why I designed my uh, feedback mechanisms and my coverage mechanisms to be generic and not to be based on coverage itself. So sweet. So we have this now. Um, I'm going to add a crash database. So, um, so this crash database is going to basically take into account the type of crash that occurred and the PC and the address. Um, uh, I think, maybe. So, I don't actually have the PC for the fault right now. Um, so I need to plumb that up somehow. Uh, but I, I don't want this print to happen every time a crash occurs, right? Because that's, that's annoying. We don't, we don't want that. So we're going to get rid of this MMU fault print from here. And now you won't see the faults, but we'll, we'll know that they're happening. So, so this is the perf that we're getting when we're fuzzing this. Actually, the perf is dropping. Why is that happening? We have 24 inputs. Why is the perf dropping? Am I losing threads? I don't think so. Maybe things are getting stuck in that input lookup. I don't think they would be. Um, hmm. Uh, okay, so what if I got rid of the get input? Is that the culprit here? None. Maybe that is racy. And it's getting stuck in that spin loop. Yeah. Or the cost of the exceptions is too high. Oh, I think that's what it is. Because we never fixed we never fix the exceptions being expensive. So exceptions right now are too expensive. And this is causing like most of the fuzz cases to have exceptions now. So I need to go into the um Yeah, so we're gonna make a cache. And that's that's our that's our biggest issue right now. Folk Isle source, I um Isle session, ah Folk Isle, Isle session. And the issue here is on an MMU fault, um I have to try to see if it's actually a real fault. And in this case, it's really expensive because I have to. I have to do a soft MMU check, which is going to get access to the master, which acquires a lock. Um, so I'm going to cache this information. So I'm going to keep track of faults that are safe. Um, I guess more specifically, I actually want to track... I want it to fail closed. So I want this to track faults that are safe. Or I want this to track faults that are unsafe. And then if it's if it's an unsafe okay yep so um and what do we have there for parameters so uh, mu fault so we have the type is right size addresses um so we're gonna go through each lane and we're gonna extract the address and if so we're gonna have like if vm dot uh, known faulting. If it is a known faulting thing, so if it's not known to be faulting, then we're going to check. If it's known to be a faulting thing, um, is this wrong in some cases? Yeah, it is. Because uh, this means if an address map changed. Um, I could do like in... Uh, I basically need to skip this logic. I need to only run this logic if something is in the master VM. But I don't know that until I've checked the fault. And let me see if there's a way 
as p I'm gonna use source. So the problem is if I do a uh, write routine, well, that's gonna go into translate. Uh, um, uh, fork from, reset, add memory, vert to fizz. So everything goes through vert to fizz int, and this has, this will then, if, the, the slowdown is coming from this master lookup. So if memory does not exist in this VM, it's possible that the master has it and we should lazily fill it in. Um, I think what I want to have is a cache in the MMU for each one, and it will know if something is in the master. I failed to translate the address. Okay. So I want like a not in master database. Uh, global master lock. Yep, yep. It very, it is very ugly. Um, do I need a lock? Because the master can fault things in. Release the lock. So this is this is the bottleneck right here. This is why it's slow. Um, and the reason for that is I need to get access to the master, and the master, if I'm not mistaken can mutate because the master can be fetching that the master can be is it possible for that to ever mutate in the master case i think there's a reason um if it can mutate if it can't mutate there's no mapping otherwise we oh lazily fill it in um Oh, hmm. Why do I need the lock? Who uses master? Let's see. Uh, fork from easy, uh, reset. Get access to the master. Translate the master's uh, memory. So what is this can mutate? The issue is can mutate is true here. And can mutate... Oh, is this because masters can have masters? Oh, it's because I... Yeah, I allow for uh, infinite forking. So what I can do is I can just say false here. And I think this is fine for my case. We'll see if there's a panic. And then I can get rid of the lock. Um, is this... Okay, and then I need the get input. I do have the get input. Maybe I need that to be true. Get input... By setting this to true, I get, I think it's incorrect without it true. For some reason, I, I don't remember what, what it's relying on in the master. Okay, so we do need that true, which means we need to lock the master, which then means we need a cache of things that are known to not be in the master. And we pass in the original virtual address. Um... And I just want to page align that. So uh, do I page align it? Uh, page size. Size of a page. Uh, page index mask to get the bottom bits. Okay. So I want page index mask. So I'm going to say uh, let page adder is equal to the uh, original virtual address and the not get the page aligned address and then uh, self dot master has adder page adder so um, master does doesn't have adder uh, and we're gonna say master uh, master not contains 
it's kind of gross. So, uh, self dot this. Um, so we'll say if master does not contain the address. So at this point, we failed to do the resolution. And if the master does not contain page adder, so if it does not contain that, then we return none. So the first time we come through, this database will be empty. Um, uh, dot contains. So get the page line address, uh, return out early if we know the master does not map this page. If it does not contain this address, page adder, then return none. Otherwise, we're going to actually go into the master. Um, oh, we could have an exception handler. OK, so if there's a master, if there's a master, and uh, we can, hmm. Uh, we're going to do a tuple. We're going to say if some false. So if we have a master and it is and uh, contains is false. So it means we it might be in the master. OK, so we get the page address. We're going to see if we have a master and the master is not known to not contain page address. It's kind of weird. Master not contains address. OK. Then here. Otherwise, um, master doesn't have this memory. Uh, update our cache. So we're going to do this dot insert, and we're going to, uh, OK. So we're going to insert this page address. So we're going to say that the master does not have page, page address. We've resolved it. We tried it once. We, we now are never going to try that again, because now it's contained in there, which would set that to true. And then we'd skip that, and we'd still go to the exception handler. OK. Woo! Um, <laughs> and this is going to be a hash set of u uh, vert adder. So list of addresses, a list of pages that are known to not be um, contained in the master. List of pages that are known to not be contained in the master. OK. And this is a hash set new. So this is only ever used if there's actually a master. So we don't really have to worry about the size or memory usage there. And then we're going to log all the pages that are known to not be in master. Um, that database might grow too much. Um, but it does have to be this inverse cache. So master does not contain page address. OK. Uh, and yep, that needs to be vert adder. So we're going to get the this dot zero. Where is it? Uh, page adder. OK, and this is going to be equal to a vert adder of this. I just strongly type my virtual addresses so it's obvious what's going on. And then that needs to be a reference for contains. OK, so uh, move occurs there. Dot SRF on this. And then that can just be there. OK. Woo! So now our perf should be fine. Yeah, now our perf is back to normal because it's it locally checks that table to see if if master has that. So now we're back to a decent fuzz case number. We're up to, uh, looks like we're probably running about 40 million fuzz cases per second on our tiny little test application. We're also going through the bootloader. Um, but I guess the bootloader just branches into this. 
but we're performing an allocation. Um, if we actually didn't do the allocation, we would get a lot more perf here. Probably not a lot more, but a little bit more. Just a little smidge. So we'll do char star input is equal to global input. And this is going to screw up alignment. So I'm actually going to just do this. I'm going to do global input. This is going to be always 20 hex bytes. And we're going to put some magic in here. We're going to put in... Um, we're going to put in some random number, and then we're going to just find it in the address. And you know what? <sighs> ah. I could make the data section start at a at a known address. Oh, but I don't I don't support that in my Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Yep. That's going to change the shape of our binary. Uh And this is a reference to that. Uh, incompatible pointer types. Uh, I can do this. What are you talking about? Oh, is it the constant doesn't like? Yeah. Okay. It's about to say. There we go. Okay, so we built that. We just need to get the address of that. And I'm, I'm going to put some magic in here. OX foo. Oof. Foof. We'll put some foofs in there. That'll do. It'll initialize the rest to uh, zero. Okay, we built that. We're going to copy our program in. Shoop, doop, doop. Okay, and then we just want to find our foofs which are going to be like after the text section. Where are they? A lot of code in here now. Uh, here we go. Here they are. They're at 217B. So now we just need to update our fuzzer. So I'm glad we fixed that bug. That's good. It's, it's not really a bug. It's just a perf issue. Um, that's the address to write in the input. And we should be good. So now we're using a, a global, yeah, so now we're running, si since we're not performing the malloc, which is kind of expensive, uh, now we're performing, and we're not doing the mem copy. now we're doing 90 million fuzz cases per second, uh, which is pretty solid, I ain't complaining, 92 million fuzz cases per second, um, and that's with full coverage and, and everything, so now we can take our coverage and we can see we're, we're definitely hitting the crashing case. So take this uh, color. Um, why is there execution at those addresses? Is that? Well, that's not right. Um, 217E? Wait, how are we executing there? How are you? Oh, did we? What do we do? Uh, oh, it's at 217B. Is that where I put it? 217B. Yep, write it in. Writing in the five bytes. This is doing foof, and it's checking on input. Whoa. What did I, did I actually, did I implement a bug and this is catching a bug? How cool is that? Let me add the print back on this. Yep. <laughs> Are we executing like random shit or do we have a massive bug in our coverage stuff? Oh, it's probably because we're not returning, ma oh, mask none, that's fine. Because that's what it will return by default. Okay. No, that's accessing foob. Why is that in our coverage file? Why does our coverage file... Oh, um, I didn't pull down the coverage text, the correct coverage text. <sighs> okay, there we go. There we go. It won't clear the coverage for that because uh, it only clears it in code. So we can just reload our input here. Yeah, we we were we literally just had the wrong coverage uh, file. 
So it was using like offsets from an existing one. I was like, that makes no sense. Okay, P, this, script, color, okay. So here's all the coverage. Obviously we're hitting every block. We're getting to the end, that's breaking out. Everything's good. Okay, that means I can comment this out again. And now, okay, so the perf was correct. Woof, scared there for a second. Okay, so yeah, we're getting 90, 94 million, probably like 98 million fuzz cases per second on our tiny little application. But hey, that's, uh, that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. And we're getting, we're getting probably equivalent crashes per second. We're probably getting like 10 million crashes per second, uh, which is good. Um, all right, so now we just need something to fuzz. I need like I need like some small like ANSI C code something I can build that works with int where int size of int is uh, two bytes, uh, which basically will break every application. So I just need like some small program. So I'm gonna take a quick bio break. I'll be right back. All right, what should we fuzz? I think we have basically everything. We don't have like crash saving. I guess I probably should add that. Hmm. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is VM exit callback, update those. These are basically like the first chances here. So disable VMs which caused a uh, VM exit. Okay. So then I should be able to do just in here, an aisle session. We'll have like a want like some database of crashes and crashes are pretty, I guess we can't get a lot cause we're gonna get a lot of crashes. 
some of these data structures get really hard when you have like 25 million crashes per second because you can't just grab locks to things willy-nilly. It's quite the struggle. That's why perf is bad. Don't write fast fuzzers. It makes your life hard. Um, we want... We want to save the inputs that cause crashes. So when a crash occurs, we want to save all the all of the inputs. Hmm. I need to generate a hash for a for crashes. So I think I'll take in a I'll result and I'll generate a hash for that event. And then I'll have a crash database. And Yeah, and that should be we just don't want to hurt perf, you know? We don't we don't want to lose perf when we uh when we have these. So at the end match exit code here. At the end, we're gonna do a we're gonna do a self dot report crashes. Technically they're VM exits. So we're gonna do self dot report crashes. We're going to give the caused VM exit, and then we're going to also give it a, um, so we got caused VM exit, and then I'm going to throw in the exit code. So report crashes. Nice. Now we just got to implement that. Pub FN report crashes. This will be caused VM exit, which is a mask. We're going to take a, a reference to self and an exit code. Oh, this will be on aisle session, actually. So we're going to report a crash, and the exit code will be an aisle result. And we're just going to whack this into uh, uh, impl.star aisle session. Here we go. And report crashes. So now we know all the VMs that caused a possible exception. We actually don't know the PC. <laughs> we don't know what PC caused the exception. Um, we might want to add that. I don't know. The little things in life. For VM in... For VM ID and cause VM exit dot iter. So we're going to go through each VM that caused a VM exit. I'm also going to need to have the inputs passed into here. Um, otherwise, I won't know what inputs to save on a crash. And we also want crashes to go into the coverage database as well. So what we're going to do is um, self.add inputs, and then we'll pass in input VM ID. So this will be inputs. So... Um, Go through, go through each crashing VM. Uh, report, uh, save, save off crashing inputs. Okay, and then this will take inputs, which will be a reference to a vector of a U8 and a, uh, what is the size of this vector size? So report crashes. This will take in a uh, reference to self.fuzz inputs, I think. I think uh, I think we're good. Uh, not quite. Um, that's uh, semi, and that might get us everything. Oops. Vector size, vector size. Whoa. What was that? Found U size. I typoed somewhere. Where did I put an 8? Uh, 508. Oh, it's a uh, vector width. Yep, sorry, wrong scene. Okay. So now we have that. We're going to go through... That's going to be on all VM exits, which is not what we want. 
that's going to cause some like input bloat. Um, out of entries in the atomic hash map. Um, really? Add input. Uh, fetcher insert hash hash. Is this just seen like an infinite amount of hashes? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Match exit code. And we want to say basically uh, return. So uh, by default, this is not a crash. Cool. So we fixed it. Um, now we just need to filter that down. All our arms diverge. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so this should be fine. Yep, of course. And now we need to handle the aisle results that we think are crashes. So, um, aisle result down here, we have MMU fault. Oops, uh, E, bulk aisle source, allograph mod. So, really just MMU fault is all we care about. So, fault, uh, and we're just going to say this one, uh, faults are crashes. So every time we get a fault, then we want to figure out if that fault is unique. And to do that, we need to get uh, like a unique identifier for this crash. So we'll want to get a mix of like PC, the address, the size of the access, and the type. Um, in fact, I'm going to just do this. Let fault type um, if let I'll result MMU fault type is right size adders. So go through each crashing VM. Then we're going to get the address. Uh, get the faulting address for this VM. This is equal to adders.extract VM ID. Okay, so now we have the type is right size and the addresses, or the address. So we'll make a crash database. Um, and we'll just put it in here. This will be uh, crash DB crash database that and the hash yeah it's just gonna be a hash actually we can tuple that so if we make this an actual tuple uh tuple then we'll be able to actually validate and we won't have to worry about hash collisions because hash collisions will be resolved by checking the actual contents of the um uh, key unlike the input database in which case i don't want to compare the inputs every time we try to add something so we just allow hash collisions there the odds of a hash collision on an input are so low that it, it just doesn't matter. Okay. So the crash database is going to have a key that contains the basically the same info as an MMU fault. And that is a MMU fault type followed by a bool followed by a U8, which is the size, and followed by an address. Uh, tuple is, ooh, what is uh, MME fault type? Um, that's access or um, oops, mod.rs, can close this. Uh, the fault type is alignment or access. Okay. So tuple is that. Crash database uh, key is uh, fault type is right, access size, address. And then that's going to reference uh, an input that caused it. So we got that key, and it's going to reference uh, val is uh, input hash that caused the crash, and that allows us to reproduce the bug when we want to. So let's make sure 
Uh, default's not implemented for uh, fault type. Yup, because it's an enum. And I need that for ht. So I think I'll just impl default there. Uh, impl default for me fault type fn default self self alignment. It's not great, but whatever. Um, missing crash db. Great. So input db. So we'll do crash db is equal to ht new crash database size. We go up here. Oops. Uh, size of the crash database. Const this use size is just uh, 32k is probably fine for that one. Uh, crash db. Crash db. Port crashes and yep. If that is equal to exit code, then we're going to go through these and now we have to compute a hash. So uh, the crash um, key is going to be the uh, type is right size adders, uh, or in this case adder because it's resolved. And then we're going to, yeah, we have two of these open. Um, then we're going to implement the hash. So let me hash is OU128. And what's the best way we hash this? Do we have enough room? The type is a... Uh, we can U8 that type. Is right, we can... What's a bit? So one byte, one byte, a bit. Yeah, I think we can just fit everything. Everything gets its own slot in the hash. So the type will shift by... Uh, um, we'll do the hash is equal to OU128. And then the hash um, or equals the adder. Hash shift equals um, 64. So we or in the address as a U128. We're going to or in the uh, size, and that's an 8-bit. We're going to or in the uh, is right. We'll do that as 8 bits as well. It doesn't really matter. As u8. Um, or we can just do as u128, I think, directly. In fact, this we can do 1. Um, and I'm just going to do... We'll do uh, if is right. Just so it's like very concrete what the types are. We'll do if is right 1 else... Zero, so it's one bit, and then hash or equals the type as u8, and then hash shift left equals. I don't know. We'll give that eight um, as u128. Okay, so now we have the best hash ever ever created, and we're gonna do uh, self dot crash db dot fetch or insert. We'll take the hash, and then we'll pass in the crash key. We'll match this. Honestly, we only care about the error case. If error ent is equal to this, then times ent or ent dot insert uh, box new, and then the value, which is going to be the hash. So this will be the um, here. We only save the crashing input when it's unique, in which case we will then have the let input hash is equal to this. We box that up, and we're done. So create the unique ID for the crash. We'll need a PC for that too, so we'll change this hash eventually. Um, create a hash for the crash. And I think that should be good. And then this will be... Um, Check if this is the first time the crash has been seen. If it is, 
save off the crashing input, and then um, make the crash database reference this input for the crash type. Okay, we got some issues. Uh, expected a tuple. I think it's the crash key first. Then we've got entry if let. And I think we're done. So this will be like uh, print saw crash this crash key. And now we'll only get that printed once. Yep, we saw that crash once, and then everything else has been identical. And we also save off that extra input, because now we any crashing input we add to the database, so we we can feed that back. Addresses use 128. Size is that. Shift 8. Shift that. Okay, there we go. So now we have a crash database. Let's get the PC value for crashes. It's kind of a hard problem. But let's see what we can do here. Um, full file source JIT. Uh, I'll graph JIT. Oops. So in this case, uh, when we hit an instruction start, we're going through this block. So I could also switch to block coverage, and then that would uh, help our perf quite a bit. So I'm going to um, I'm going to say uh, let mute uh, coverage coveraged is equal to false. Um, track if uh, a coverage report has been generated for this block so it starts out as false we're going to go through the block we're going to go through the instructions and then we're going to say if we have a cc jit and this is false so if the coverage is false um then we'll go here and we'll do coverage equals true uh, log that we've generated a coverage event for this block. So now we have block coverage, which will help our perf even more. Got to take every perf win you can get. Okay. The perf is going to be basically identical. It would only be different in like a really hot loop. So maybe it's not worth doing the block coverage then. I'll add that back if I want it. I'm not a fan. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of the let mute most recent uh, PC is equal to zero. Keep track of the most recent PC. This is going to be an option. So it's going to be a none. And then on every instruction start, we'll update this to be a sum PC. So that will allow us to keep track of the most recent PC. So now when we have a uh, mem read, basically all of these, we can save the um, we can save the most recent PC into some register. Let's see. I don't know if we have any registers available for allocation. Um, I mean, technically, I could maybe get the PC based off of where we are in the JIT. That's, eh, I can optimize that later. So, this will be fine. It's going to be one extra uh, write, um, and it will only happen on faults. So, we're going to pass in, or I guess it will always happen, but whatever. It's not, it's not a big deal. So, down here is, we're going to have the... Uh, 5 OX28 most recent PC only valid for MMU faults. Okay. And then for MMU faults, mem read 
then I'm going to log um, dot unwrap. I'm going to do asm.move reg uh, mem sum r15 non ox28 immediate most recent PC. Uh, there. Log the most recently executed PC. Okay, and same thing here. And yeah, 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 yeah. In this case, we're going to say this is going to be an option of a U64, which then means this will be a, a, a DRF as U64, and then most recent PC down at these uses, we'll say as I64. And now we have another field in that tuple, which will give us the, yep, so raw trace, start off as zero, and then, um, then I can go into source, um, or folk IL, I'll graph mod, then in the fault, this will take a um, U64, which will be the PC. So U64, PC that caused the fault, and then we'll have the uh, fault. The fault type is just implied. We know what that is. Okay, so now we can get the most recent PC by accessing that dot five. So trace raw dot five. So in all these locations, the first field is going to be that. Okay, and 445 and 69. 445, this is going to be the PC. We don't use it there. And then here, we will use the PC. And we'll just uh, we'll put that in the hash. Shit. Now we're out of bits in the hash. I mean, it doesn't matter. There can be hash collisions. It's not a big deal. I'm just going to do this. The hash is going to be equal to the PC as a U128. Shifted to the left by 64. Ored with the address as U128. And that's going to ignore the other fields. Um, uh, and now we can do hash xor equals um, type. We'll just like do these things as u128 is right as u128. It's fine if we have hash, hash collisions because it's going to check for the key. So it's not a big deal. Size as u128. So PC, address, size, is right, and type all factored into the hash. Now we have a uh, print crash at x accessing x pc adder so we should now have the pc for faults just a little bit of plumbing there not too hard that was actually really clean um yep 105 in main yep we're just not printing here anymore Okay. Crash at 2103. Let's check that address. Bada bing. That's exactly where the fault's happening. That's what I like to see. Okay, so now we can save files. So we're going to also log this to a file. Create a file for the crash. And... We can just do, uh, hmm. File name is going to be a uh, path buff new crashes. We're going to say if, if file name dot exists, if it doesn't exist, we'll do a uh, uh, create dir. I think it's here. We'll do some referencing. 
dot expect failed to create crashes folder. Okay, and then in this case, we'll do a uh, file name dot push, I think. And we'll do uh, let crash name. It's gonna be equal to format of the, um, we'll put the PC in there, followed by the faulting address, followed by the, um, if it's a read or a write, followed by the size of the access. Actually, we'll put the size first. Doesn't need to be hex. And then the type. So we've got the PC, we've got the address, we've got the size. Then we're gonna have if is write, we're gonna put write, else read. Okay, put that on a new line, I guess. And then we're gonna have the final field, which is the type. So create a crash file name, create a file for the crash, then we're gonna push the crash name here. I'm gonna say if not file name dot exists, if it doesn't exist, then we're gonna um, create the crashing input file. So if it doesn't exist, then standard FS write to file name, and we're gonna write the inputs VMID. And we're gonna say expect build to write crashing inputs to disk, and we'll keep that print. That's probably ballpark, uh, path buff, yep. Use standard path, path buff. Ooh, 718, path buff will do from. That will be relative, and then we'll have we should see a crashes folder get created and then it should put stuff in there. Yep, there's our crashes folder. And we have one file in here. We have this right access. If we take a look at this file, uh, that input is not good. Um, hmm. Inputs, inputs, that's coming from report crashes, fuzz inputs, self fuzz inputs. Cosby makes it. What's up, Mizuno Kizu? Mizu, Mizuno Kizu? I don't know how to pronounce that. Thank you for following. Um, you got report crashes, VM exit, exit code, self as inputs. We're gonna go through all the VM IDs that call, we're gonna extract the address. We're then gonna report that input. We're gonna add that input. We're gonna construct that, and we're gonna write that to disk. Why is that the wrong thing? I want to see if it's the same file. It is. You know what? If we look at what it's comparing against, it's comparing against C8. Uh, if I do XXDI, this is actually right. It's comparing against C8, followed by C5, followed by CC, followed by CC, followed by CF. I don't know why that's hello. It, what is the character set? Like, I mean, it's right. Like, if we, like, I, I thought it was checking for hello. 
And if we look at the code, it's actually comparing by CC, CF, uh, CC, so H, E, L, L, O. And if we look at our input, it says this is the one that causes a crash. So it's right. <laughs> I, I was the wrong one. Um, there must be like a really weird character set. Oh, oh shit. I'm doing, I, oh uh, no, those are characters. I mean, it's right. <laughs> that's not hello, but that's, hey, I, I take right over, uh, looks good. So the 6502 must have like a different character encoding. Petsky, CBM ASCII. No. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, is what C five is then H C C five is an E. Well, it's probably in the ballpark of this encoding. C five. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what kind of encoding this uses, but uh, I mean the fuzzer's right, so. <laughs> so I'm happy with that, you know. Nice. And we're still at ninety two million fuzz cases per second, even though we're checking for that file. If I were to delete that file, oh, it won't recreate it because it's not in the database. So, yeah, there we go. We got a crash. So, I'm going to take another bio break. I'll be right back. All right. What are the What are those encodings? Is that going to cause an issue if we like try to pull in a parser or something? So we need some code to fuzz. We need some fun application to fuzz. And I just need some C thing that I can build. What's like a like, I probably can't do a JSON parser. That might be too much. Um What's like a simple file format that, that I could get like a 500 line of code parser for that's just like pure C without system utilities? We could look at like strings or something. That probably wouldn't build for the 6502. I don't know. Ping might be fine-ish. I'm not going to look for a, a PNG parsing bug on stream. It, it also needs to be uh, useless code. <laughs> I mean, I could find, like, some random ping parser that, like, doesn't matter. Hmm. Yeah, what would be something simple? What would be something fun to fuzz? I don't know. We could look at the CVE details. See if there's anything that stands out. I'm going to search for like parse. C 
CSV parse in Node.js, that's probably, yeah, that's probably important. Doesn't, okay. Parse packet in GPG. Jeez, what's this bug? Oh, that's 2006. Oh, that's ancient. Parse packet with a large length, a long user ID string, lead to an integer overflow. Yeah, we could like look for like a legacy thing. As long as it's just easy to rip out. Um, CSV2 parse. Wait, a real. Really? A, C a CSV parsing bug? That's that's impressive. That's impressive. Uh Ooh, a simple CSV parser in C. <laughs> oh, ho, ho, ho. I like that. I like that. Big fan. Are there any cra uh, known crash issues? Deal with carriage returns. We could try this bad boy out. I mean, it's pretty hard to fuck this one up. Um, like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you just get it right. I mean, I guess they have quote parsing here. They could te they could technically make a mistake there, <laughs> but that's unlikely. I, let me see if uh, CC65 can use a ASCII. Because I'd like to be able to see um, some of these strings. So is the ASCII or that codes of typed characters. Um, I wonder if there's a uh, changing character set. Yeah. Screen pointer. He is, has to begin off page foundering. Yep. Let me see. Uh, CC65. Let's see if there's any command line args that look kind of in that ballpark. Uh, CC65. I'm just looking for like a way to control the. Uh, I want to I want to change the character set so that like it looks like normal files, um, like things that we're used to. Otherwise, we're gonna have some like weird changes there. Hmm. Okay. Inline standard functions. I don't see one. Yeah. I don't know. We, we can try and build this code. Let's, uh... Let's grab it. See what happens. Uh, and make. Oops. Uh, this. Oh my God! Hard coded GCC in your make files. Get out of here. Uh, wall. You have a test too? Wow. Test parse, test on, on unescaped. CSV line, okay, okay, it works. All right. Well, that's what I like to see. I'm guessing that there won't be uh, bugs in this. I mean, I guess there you could have some off by one, some use after free. Ugh, like it's, man, it it's hard to write a bug in a CSV parser. Do you use uh, uh, sites like Over the Wire and Punable 
Um, I've never really used those things, but I have have a lot of friends who've used them successfully and have enjoyed them, so I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're good jumping off points. Given a string which might contain unescaped new lines. Okay, let's see what their test uh, does. Run test. Test. Man, this fancy. Okay, they got a string. So they got a CSV string here. They got some quotes. Um... And this is doing... It parses it as CSV. It just takes... Um, it just, oh, it does a line at a time. Given a string containing no line breaks or containing line breaks which are escaped by double quotes, extract a null terminated array of strings. One for every cell in the row. So I can't put new lines in there. Otherwise, it's not going to be happy. But that's the parser. Count fields, is that used internally? Yep. Then we got free CSV line. I mean, this code should build. I don't see any, um, I don't see any assumptions of int sizes. Yeah. Yeah, I should be able to just, uh, rrrp. yoink. And place it in here. What do you guys think? Is it going to work? Is this going to build? Uh, where do we build it? Hey! We got a CSV parser. I doubt there are bugs in this, but hey, we're going for it. Um, It doesn't like new lines, but I don't care. I don't care. If you don't like new lines, then... Uh, I'll still give you new lines. So that takes a line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a global. This is going to be input. We're going to have... We're going to fuzz 256 bytes. We'll have a size T input size, which is going to be equal to zero. I'm going to do a malloc. Um, malloc input size, mem copy into buff from input for input size, and then I'm going to call, it's a null terminated thing, so we'll call parse CSV, so we need to make sure we null terminate it, otherwise it's, it's not correct, so, you know what, I'll always add one here, and I'll just do like buff, Input size is equal to zero. Always null terminate the input to make the parser happy. Otherwise, we're going to have an out-of-bounds, obviously, but it's not intended to be used that way. So copy the input into a heap allocation. Uh, add room for a null byte. Then we null terminate the string. We call parse CSV. Okay. So we now have a CSV parser application thingy and stuff. So always null terminate, parse CSV, and let's see if this works. Um, see what happens when we run it. I, it's probably going to crash because we're going to write over some stuff. Uh, set permissions. Ooh, BSS size. Ooh, it failed to set the permissions on the BSS. Why is that? That's an R code. Uh, BSS size. Set permissions for address BSS size. I'm guessing we're adding... Oh, our application's probably too large now. Load base and then the payload length. Oh, the BSS uh, plus the BSS size. So we need room for also the BSS, which wasn't being used before. Okay, poison error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scroll, 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 scroll. Uh, invalid operand type for a load. I'm guessing 
that that's due to us writing in the fuzz input in this case. So let's just uh, let's not run in the input. We're probably clobbering some instructions there, but this should run. Oh my God! What? Do we have a six five zero two bug? Huh? Maybe. Maybe we do. Uh, export. Um. Huh. Nine twenty two. Invalid operand type for for a. Uh, for a load, I guess there's probably an instruction we've never implemented. Uh, print, yeah. So here, we'll say, actually up at the top, we'll, we'll have some like verbose mode somewhere in here. Uh, print reading instruction at this as this opcode uh, cur PC opcode. Um, dot zero. Let's see, what's our bug? Okay, ASL. So, ASL at this location. Uh, we gotta, we gotta load the new program up. Dev, uh, soft serve 6502 test, test app. Okay, and okay, and we want this two fifty seven C. That is an ASL A. Oh, huh. That must be the first A register thing I've seen. This is a uh, what type is this? Uh, address type. Let's see what this is. It's an accumulator type, and uh, we're getting a panic on that encoding. Yeah, we we must have never seen an A usage yet. That's kind of cool. Uh, 924. So uh, macro rules load. Yeah, operand. This is operand accumulator. And then the value is going to be a reg read 6502 of register A. Um, what do I call that? What do I call that variant? Uh, accumulator. Okay, so that's going to return a, when we do a load, if the address type is that, then, oh, wait, if it's an operand accumulator, in this case, decode the operand and perform memory and register access. Load, perform a load from that if it's operand accumulator, but we never construct that, right? Is that complaining about that? Yeah, never constructed. Um, operand register. Oh, that would be reg, and then we'll pass in reg here. It's like, okay, that makes sense. So register that. And then the, we give the byte size. Okay, yep. Okay, and yep, and two. If there's a register, then it's a reg read. Load expected struct target reg found enum register. What? He 
here. Um. Okay. Yeah, we we just never implemented this. We we've never come across these instructions yet. Um, that encoding of the instruction. So this is going to be. We don't want to dot into. We want this to be a register target reg. I think I just want that to be register. Hey, we're probably going to have a problem on the store side. Yep. So we'll go down to the store side. And then for this, we'll just do a register. We'll do a reg right 6502 of val. Okay. All right. Hey, it's working and it's not crashing. Okay. Nice. All right. Let's bring us some threads. Let's get rid of that print. So this isn't fuzzing yet. It's just running. I just want to see what the perf is looking like. Okay, like 10 million fuzz cases per second. Not bad. Not great. Not bad. So now I need to go find our... I need to find that data. Oh, I bet it put that data in the BSS. So I'm going to change this to make this initialize. Um, and we'll make this constant. And we'll make this constant as well. And we'll modify those uh, internally. Um, and we'll build it. We need that. That's for coverage. That we need and this we don't need. Okay, so we built it. We have the latest version. Let's grab it, put it in here. This is the like one we're going to actually do our fuzzing on. Subtract those things off. Hit P. What? Oh, I hit the wrong number. <laughs> it's like that. That's broken. Okay, yep. JSR, everything looks good. We should have 256 bytes at the end. Uh, seven, six, eight. And then she would have eight, six, eight. Nice. So we'll have a um, pointer and a length that we pass in here. So uh, const pointer, um, pointer to two, six byte buffer in the, um, application and then const len u size uh, pointer to length in application u16 and this will be at ox 2868 let's double check it 2868 let's take a reference to that that's before um i think that's our mem copy our mem copy is probably going to be the first unique function here. Yeah, it's mem copy. Okay. So 2768 to 868. We're going to write in to pointer. We're going to write in our input. I'm going to assert that the mutate input dot length is less than or equal to 256. Otherwise, we're going to have some serious issues. Make sure the length is sane. And then we're going to write the write in the the length and the length we're going to put at um, the length we're going to put in at len and it's going to be mutate input dot s slice dot len as u16. Um, and I think I just need to ref that. Yep. And make sure that's equal to two. So now we're writing in the pointer and the length. Should be good. We might actually see coverage increase now. Yep, we see coverage changing, which means we're actually like mutating things in this application. 
Um, and do we have prints on crashes? Yeah. So if you get a crash, we'll get a print. And then we just want to probably up the corruption. Mutate up to 8 bytes. And then in this case, uh, otherwise, if we don't have an input, we'll start with a uh, mutate input dot. There's like a way in Rust, uh, Rust vec to uh, resize, I think. Resize with a value. So we're going to resize this with vm.rand mod. 257 0 so create a new input of 0 to 256 bytes inclusive so that will create our input base we'll mutate some stuff off of there okay we've got more coverage than ever that looks good so I also want to then have we've got a corruption and then um, I want a chance of sometimes doing that. So I'm going to do if, if let sum that, then we're going to do uh, let generate equals false, else generate is equal to true. So generate's going to be equal to vm.rand mod. Um, so if not generate, if we're not generating, then we try to use an existing input. And then if that failed, then we set generating. And then generate is going to be equal to if VM mod 8 is equal to 0. So a 1 in 8 chance of generating. We're going to actually do a 1 in 4 chance of generating uh, a new input. Which right now we're not actually really doing anything, but if generate creates, that's just going to um, set it to A's. We're going to have 0 to 256 A's for our input. Then we're going to mutate up to 8 bytes in that thing. That will be using feedback. Okay. It's not a good fuzzer. Um, oh, divisor of 0. I think I always expect the input devil length. So if mutate input.len is greater than zero, problem solved. Six oh six, six sixteen, we're getting coverage increases. I think we've seen like 626 or something. 640. We have 47 inputs. Not the best fuzzer in the world. We're pretty at pretty good amounts of coverage at 640. So we can take a look at what we're missing. So we've got our, uh, where's our coverage file back here. We'll pop this in Ida. Let's see what our coverage looks like. So we're going to have load Y1. Okay. This is probably yeah. This is this is probably the uh, the parser. So let's see. We've got perfect coverage, perfect coverage, perfect coverage, perfect coverage. We're missing a couple blocks in here. Missing a missing a few like weird edge cases. Um. This one's checking for an OXD. That's looking for a carriage return. We can try and figure out what code that is. That might be a little bit hard to figure out. So this is uh, someone's looking for an OXD or a, a, an, a carriage return here. So if it's, or I guess we don't even know what character that is because we don't know what encoding this architecture uses. Um,
What is this doing? JSR, JSR, JSR. Um, yeah, we're kind of stuck at that 640 coverage, so we're missing. We're missing like one, two, three, like six blocks. How complex is the state machine on this? Hmm. There might not be any bugs. Uh, let's see. These are calling that. So we haven't seen this function. Uh, we haven't seen this. Okay, that's kind of cool. That could be some some meat there. These. What? That. Why would it? Oh, that's uh, that's a call to Alec. So somewhere, this is a Malik here. That's going to transfer A to X. Okay, so we've got a mallet call here. And if we're missing a mallet, then we're missing a lot. Or maybe that's a free. That's probably a free. Okay. So this is probably where this is. This is if... If B pointer... If D ref the B pointer, stir dupe temp. Then if not, if it's a null terminator, if it's a null terminator, then we're going to have a loop. Do we have a loop here? Yes, we do. Yeah, here's our loop. So this is the code that we're missing here is we're missing this branch. We're never, we've never set the first byte to a zero. Kind of surprising, but we haven't. Uh, I guess that's duping a temp. Temp is that plus sterling line. If not temp free buff, return null. Stir dupe that. Oh, if the stir dupe failed. Oh, so this is if, if an allocation failure occurs. So if alloc fails, then it will clean up and return out. Um, and yeah, our allocator never returns a, a failure. So that code can't get hit, which then means this code can't get hit. So this is going to perform two more frees. This is the free of buff, and this is the free of temp. So then what else do we have? We probably have a couple, we probably have the other case. This is probably, this is freeing, um, so we can just name this free. So this is performing a free in this case, if that malloc fails, and I bet this is uh, returning null if that fails. So basically, we have we have perfect code coverage. We got perfect code coverage immediately on this target. Um, not too surprising. So basically, we're just missing those error paths. Let's uh let's make our allocator return failure some percentage of the time. And then we'll probably be at perfect coverage. Like you never know, you can have uh you can have bugs in the failure like cleanup paths. That's pretty common cuz they're one of the least tested things. So we're going to say um we're going to say if vm dot rand mod 64 is equal to zero. Uh, random chance of returning null from malloc. And then that's going to be... Okay. Uh, Advanced PC passed the trap. We're going to return out the 16-bit pointer, which is going to be null. 
And then we're going to return caused VM exits. So we're going to say that we handled all the VMs in that case. So now we should have more code coverage. Oh my, oh my God. What? Are those real? Oh, that's, that's in our case. Our code doesn't check for null. <laughs> okay. That's our fault. So in our code, when we invoke it, if not buff return <laughs> so that's us hey so our code works <laughs> okay we gotta we gotta get those new pointer addresses so let's go grab the um, test app update those pointers look at that a little fuzzer works I don't I don't think there's gonna be bugs in their code. It, it actually looks pretty solid. Uh, 2778. And there should be 2878. There should be two bytes. Yeah. Two eight seven eight. Okay. All right. Let's see. Yep, our coverage is looking, what was it before? Was it 600 or was it 800? I don't remember what it was before. Let's see what our coverage looks like. Oops, I screwed that up. Not a big deal. And script color. Okay, P. Jump. This is our parse. There's there's one thing we're missing. We're missing one. We're missing a couple jumps. So we have. Yeah, we're missing two instructions so we're missing some success case here which is probably a match on a comparison so we're missing a match on a comparison and we're missing uh uh another match on a comparison um on an or not quite sure what those two things are I don't think this emits any ors. So branch if not equal to here. That's what we're always seeing. We're, we never see the zero case when we're oring. Oh, this is a stack. This is the software stack. This is checking for if you're like out of stack space because this is a, uh, yeah. So LDY, this is, is that? That's the high byte of the stack, decrementing it, and then it's seeing if, oh, this is seeing if we use, uh, if the stack needs to wrap. If it needs to wrap, then it's probably going to update like a high byte or something. Is it? That's a, those conditions I, I don't think we can hit um, unless we had like different uh, stack shapes when we invoke this application. So yeah, we have perfect coverage of this um, and there's no bugs. There could be some crazy state machine that we're not tracking with coverage. I would hazard that they probably just don't have bugs. It's a CSV parser. It's not that hard to get right. Okay. Cool. So there are no bugs there. Let's see if there was a like a fixed bug. Fixed bug. Oh, that's an F read. 
Um, include standard lib. Add comment. Correct function name. First commit. Ooh. Properly free memory. Um, free CSV line. Oh, that's when we, um, I don't think we're calling the like free CSV line. Yeah. That's the parsed output. Was it broken? Parsed. How is that different? B pointer. Okay, let's check out the very original version that they had. This is their initial commit. So we'll we'll check out their very initial commit. And we'll see if we can find bugs in it. So it sounds like they had a bug. Or or maybe it's more like uh it didn't free something that should be freed. But that's uh I think that's a valid-ish uh, thing. So, see dev CSV parser. Git checkout. Uh, reset hard. Git checkout this. Git log. We're gonna do this. We're gonna git checkout. Git log. So we're at the first commit. We can't get any older than that. CSV.c. And I'm guessing that you're supposed to call this. So you're supposed to call parse CSV. Let's see. Read me. Uh, returns, null, returns a null terminate array of strings encoded on the indicated line of CSV. Otherwise, it returns null if there's insufficient RAM uh, or that it's not properly encoded. So if it's non-null, we'll want to call free. So there's their old free implementation. Let's check it out. Let's grab their stuff. Replace it. Okay. Now, in our stuff, we'll say um, uh, void times ret is equal to this. If ret, then free ret. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we have our new application. We just need to get the new offsets. Doop, doop, doop. Doop, doop, doop. Uh, I mean, uh, we just add 2,000 to this. Eight A, I think, yeah. So two, seven, eight A. 278A, and then we have 288A. All right, let's see. Allocators oom. And they have crashes. Huh. Allocators oom. Let's, uh, if allocators oom, then we want to return. What's our size? We allow, we allow a lot of memory. So if that Ooh. is greater than that, then um, we'll do uh, macro rules return null. Okay. So we have a random chance of returning null. We have a random chance of 
or if if the allocator is oom, then we return null. I think that bugs. I think it's buggy. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. That's a 4141 DRF. How cool is that? And that's at 2082. Let's load up this. Done. This. So, yeah, they fixed some bugs. It used to have bugs. <laughs> uh, let's kind of get auto analysis working here. That. So, this. Yeah, it was just buggy. It was that one instruction, this 2082. Oh, uh, 2684 also could deref incorrectly. So, yeah, there you go. There's some bugs, and it, it finds them, I think, right away. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's an out of bounds on the heat. Because these are all heap addresses. Yeah, these are probably heap overflows. There you go. You got bugs. See? And we don't look like look at our generator. We don't even we don't even do anything. We supply a we supply four ones as the array, and then we randomly mutate up to eight bytes, and that's it. And then we use feedback, and then feedback finds us crashes. We didn't even have to like do anything here. It just works. So there you go. There's there's bugs. It was like two different two different crashes, I think. Yeah, two different bugs. And I'm guessing free CSV line. I'm, I guess it probably fixed that. What was it doing before? So before it would deref parsed, and while while there is a thing, it would go to the next one, and then it would free that, and they changed it to have. Pointer is equal to parse times pointer, pointer plus plus. I'm trying to see what the difference is here. Oh, it would then free the wrong thing at the end. Yeah. It would free the wrong thing at the end, which we're probably actually not seeing. Um, oh, yeah, we should, we should eventually see that. I think we should eventually see a free of like invalid memory. I think we have to generate valid CSV to hit that case, which is probably the hardest thing for our fuzzer to do is to generate like one thing worth of CSV. Uh, back pointer is null. Cause I would expect to see a free of the wrong the wrong address and I should be able to catch that but they also must have fixed a couple other bugs what ha, I wonder what I'm curious what was broken um I I wonder what what they changed and when they fixed it. F read K. Okay. Maybe does it use after free? What we should do is probably parse a couple times in a loop. So let's see uh twenty eight two. Let's see if we can figure out what code this is. Um. This is like a main loop, called from here. Let's uh let's have this run for a minute. Get some coverage stats. 555. Uh, well, we got coverage of everything. Not not a surprise. We've never seen it go down this path. That is a free So this is doing something and then which one's free this one free 
Okay. So where does this application free in a loop? This is in the... This is in their free. So we're hitting a crash here. Free DRF parsed, parse plus plus. Hmm, I'm not quite sure why that's crashing. Free parsed. And that's DRFing. Or is that 2082, I think, was the crash? 2082. This is derefing uh, 8 plus 0. That's storing to 8 and 9. And it's trying to deref that pointer. Uh, A and X. So this is returning... Yeah, parse, it's, it's trying to deref. Uh, I think this can potentially return success and then fill in a bad pointer. Oh, yeah, that's probably the, um, that's probably the nulling here. Properly null terminate buffer in CSV. And since they don't null terminate that buffer, it goes off the end of the buffer, and we end up accessing out of bounds on the heap. And that's what our crashes are. So the 2082 is a crash due to an out-of-bounds access on the heap. And this one is a... What's this bug? Loading A8, this is... This is used kind of in the middle. I don't actually know what this is doing. This is in actually missing missing a lot of coverage now. What are all these cases? Oh, I think it's just always crashing. <laughs> Maybe compare with a quote, or am I not putting it in at the right location? I think it's just like unconditionally crashing. I think it just always goes out of bounds. Um, I wonder if there's a way for me to get like that, that debug info. Um, Cause it's not like parsing anything. I, I think it's just like always crashing now. Two one seven D. Oh, so uh, the only function this calls is count fields. Let's take a look at this function. Oh, that's the free. Okay, so in this, is this count fields? No. This is called from two locations. Something that loads Y3, JSR, calls a couple things. Um, that's going to call the free. So someone's calling free CSV line. This is free CSV line, this function right here. It's interesting. We never get to the free. It always crashes in this case. Not too surprising. Yeah, I think it's just always crashing. <laughs> I think it's not actually parsing anything because I think it's just always going at oob on the heap. All right. So look at that. We found bugs. We built something for 6502 and then found bugs in it. How cool is that? Obviously, they've been fixed. But, uh, all right. I might call it there. That was a fun stream. You guys have any questions before I uh, head out here?
note takers. All right. Well, I'm going to start heading out then. Hope you guys had fun.